Whether you're a fan of jump scares or not, there's no denying the monumental popularity of Five Nights at Freddy's. There's something special about those creepy animatronics that really speaks to the heart of horror enthusiasts and lore lovers. And those people that want to get with Chica. Fair. The FNAF pizza party started almost a decade ago and hasn't really shown any signs of stopping. Hopefully the neighbors understand. Welcome back to the leaderboard. We've got quite the collection of Five Nights at Freddy's facts for you today. 470 of them if you can believe it. Check the security cameras, put on a bib, and maybe don't drink too much coffee because we're about to scare our way through FNAF history. We'll start with an overview of the FNAF timeline. This one hit our channel four years ago to the tune of 3.1 million views. Guess folks really like the history of Five Nights at Freddy's. It'll get you mostly up to date on the overarching lore, and it'll help you place some of the other facts that we'll mention throughout this video. Don't expect anything to be truly solved though, as Scott Cawthon really loves throwing curveballs. Hello? Hello, hello? Well, if you're hearing this, you know that we're headed back into a magical place for kids and grown-ups alike, where fantasy and fun come to life. That's right. We're diving into the horrifying and extremely complicated, some may say unnecessarily complicated, timeline of Five Nights at Freddy's. By the end of this video, you should be ready to tackle Help Wanted. As a disclaimer, I want to mention that these are all theories drawn from the game theorists and other FNAF theorists out there. Also, these are the most likely dates based on the years given in Phone Guy's many voicemails over the series. Some people claim that the series starts closer to 1972 rather than the late 70s or even 1982, but the only two confirmed dates in the games are the Bite of 83 and the Bite of 87. So I'm working off of those dates. I've organized this by major chronological event. A store opens, a store closes, a slew of children die, whatever. In each event, I'll talk about how that event affected the animatronics, what, if any remnant is involved, if there was any effect on the Fazbear Company, and whether the event affected the unfortunate Afton family at all. Also, I believe the only FNAF books I'm including in this timeline are The Fourth Closet and The Survival Log Book, and even then, very loosely. Cool? Cool. Let's begin in 1982 with the first five victims. The earliest concrete date in this game is 1983, but a lot happens before the fateful bite of 83. So my guess is that Henry and William Afton became business partners sometime in the late 70s and early 80s, and then opened Fred Bear's Family Diner soon after. Following the success of the first location, which was incident-free until the fateful bite of 83, William and Henry opened several additional locations in rapid succession in 1982 and 83. Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, Circus Baby's Pizza, and later, a second Freddy Fazbear's Pizza location. That's the a sister location that Phone Guy mentions in FNAF 3, which MatPat theorizes is also the location called Juniors, from the Midnight Motorist minigame in FNAF 6. I trust MatPat and his super in-depth analysis of FNAF, so we're just gonna go with that theory too. Plus, it just makes this discussion a lot easier. So by the end of 1983, the Fazbear Company has four locations open and active, but nothing wild happens in 1982. Oh yeah, except for the missing children incident at the first Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. We know from the Take Cake minigame and basic FNAF lore that Purple Guy slash William Afton is the one responsible for the missing children. His first victim is Susie. Wearing the Spring Bonnie Springlock suit, William convinces her to follow him with the promise that he can show her where her dog is. Then, he her and shoves her in the Chica suit. We know Susie goes first because of Chica's lines in Ultimate Custom Night, some telling passages in the fourth closet, and the Fruity Maze minigame in FNAF 6. So that leaves four other missing children for William to gut. Three of these children were named Gabriel, Fritz, and Jeremy but we don't know which order they were killed in, only that they weren't the first. These children were, ostensibly, stuffed into Freddy, Foxy, and Bonnie, respectively. And then, there's Golden Freddy. Thanks to MatPat and Reddit user DPowerful1, we know that the spirit inhabiting the slumped over Golden Freddy suit belongs to a girl named Cassidy. Cassidy may not have been William Afton's first victim, but she becomes the infamous one you should not have killed because of her undying thirst for vengeance. In fact, we're led to believe that she's the one responsible for creating the hellscape William has to endure an ultimate custom night. In 1983, Freddy Fazbear's Pizza closes, which makes sense seeing as a bunch of children disappeared. Though apparently it's because of a generally unsettling feeling as opposed to any legal action or police involvement. Huh. Don't worry, that's coming down the pipeline. It's all good for the Fazbear Company though, because they've still got Fred Bear's Family Diner and Circus Baby's Pizza. They also decided to open a second, larger Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, Junior's, just around the corner from our dear murderous Williams house. Now at this point, the exact order of events gets a little mathy. 
There's a lot of differing opinions out there, but I'm generally sticking with the MatPat timeline, which posits that the next Fazbear fatality happens at Circus Baby's Pizza. And that death is the murder of Elizabeth Afton. So Circus Baby's Pizza opens, complete with the circus-inspired animatronics Ballora, BB, Balloon Boy, and Circus Baby herself. They all dial FNAF's overall creep factor right on up to 11. By this time, we all know that William Afton is a murderous jerk. He's responsible for the deaths of five children and for imbuing five already horrifying animatronics with perpetual torturous undeadness. But for once, William didn't mean to kill a kid. And that's because the kid who dies at Circus Baby's Pizza is his own daughter, Elizabeth Afton. She's excited to see what Circus Baby can do. Machine made ice cream, anyone? So she sneaks onto the stage with the animatronic, who goes into Child Killer 3000 mode and yoinks little Elizabeth right into her open stomach cavity, because FNAF is the least messed up game series in existence. The store closes and William freaks out a little bit, understandably. So according to William, kids can and should die, just as long as they're not one of his own kids. Later in 1983 comes Michael Afton's torture. So Will takes all of the Circus Baby's pizza robots and literally buries them underground where sister location takes place. More on that later. He also thinks to himself, what better way to keep my son Michael safe than by ruining his life with nightmarish visions of the animatronics? Some theorize that William brainwashed his kid this way because Michael's favorite place is the newly opened Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, aka Junior's, just up the road. These theories are based off the idea that Michael Afton is the victim of the Bite of 83, so I'll run with that too. Admittedly, this theory gets a little squirrely, especially when you consider that the Bite victim of 83 has an older brother, and William Afton is supposed to only have two children. Maybe, like YouTuber Andy Matronic, you read into the Vampire TV show from Sister Location and you consider Mike Schmidt, the OG security guard from FNAF 1, to be William's much despised, possibly illegitimate older son. Like the Mangle theory, this is super cool in concept and definitely deepens the FNAF lore. Unfortunately, it's too messy for us to get into here. So we're just going to assume that Michael Afton is the bite victim of 83, but has no older brother, even though the minigames insist that he does. Hey. Even the best game designers contradict themselves. Hey, it happens. Long story short, Circus Baby's Pizza closes after Elizabeth Afton dies and possesses the Circus Baby animatronic. William begins torturing his remaining child, Michael Afton, so that he'll be too afraid of the animatronics to get anywhere near them and, you know, die as a result. While all of this is happening, Henry still has no idea that his partner is a serial killer and worse terrible dad. Also, to protect his own daughter, Charlie, Henry adds upgraded security systems to the newly opened Freddy Fazbear's Pizza slash Juniors in the form of the security puppet. The puppet is specifically designed to keep an eye on Charlie at all times, presumably because Henry doesn't want his daughter getting stomach chomped by any of the animatronics there. And yeah, there's still a child predator on the loose, so <laughs> there's that. Which leads to the bite of 83 at Fred Bear's Family Diner. You'd hope that after all of this, the Aftons could catch a break. Maybe? Do we really have sympathy for serial killers? I'm not sure. In any case, the Afton family is not having a good year to say the least. Much to William's dismay, the nightmares and torture he's inflicting on Michael aren't keeping him from running to Junior's. They're definitely making him extremely afraid of Fredbear though. At least Michael's still friends with the psychic stuffed animal Fredbear. Anyway, in a pretty sadistic move, William forces his son to have his birthday at Fredbear's family diner and things go poorly. Michael gets shoved into Golden Fredbear's mouth and then crushed between his jaws. Happy birthday! You get the bite of 83. I hope you like it, Mikey. After that, he dies, but not before William, via psychic plush Fredbear, ominously assures Michael, I will put you back together again. Needless to say, Fredbear's family diner closes down after the bite of 83, which makes Junior's the last operational Fazbear restaurant, or the time being at least. It seems to do okay, actually, despite some rough stuff that goes down later, but Again, I'll get into that later. So after all of this family drama, William and Henry have a falling out. Even before Michael dies, William is all kinds of stressed out. His erratic behavior leads Henry to suspect that maybe William had something to do with the original missing children incident. You, you think, Henry? Wow, that's some, some great detective work. So Henry stops allowing William into juniors. Now that I think of it, that might be the reason why William had Michael's birthday party at Fred Bear's family diner instead. But. But I digress. After Michael dies, William is even more murdery than usual, and he decides to kidnap and kill Henry's daughter, Charlie, outside of Junior's. Charlie's spirit then goes on to possess the puppet, and she acts as a kind of protector to the other possessed animatronics. That would be very sweet of you, Charlie, but have you guys seen this puppet? It is beyond creepy. In the minigame Give Gifts, Give Life, we see her shepherding the lost spirits of the murdered children into the original Freddy, Foxy, Bonnie, and Chica suits. Now between 1983 and 1987, we have the next five victims. 
Undeterred, William continues his killing spree by sneaking into Junior's dressed as a security guard. He gets into the Springlock Bonnie suit and kills five more children by luring them into the safe room and then stuffing them into the toy animatronics. That's why the animatronics freak out whenever they see someone in a security uniform, and why Mangle attacks the night guard Jeremy Fitzgerald in The Bite of 87. Speaking of which, The Bite of 87 is actually one of the only non-fatal animatronic-related attacks in Five Nights at Freddy's. According to Phone Guy's message in FNAF 1, the victim of The Bite of 87, Jeremy Fitzgerald, had to have his frontal lobe removed. That definitely does not sound pleasant, but hey, at least he's still alive, just like Phineas Gage. Too bad that didn't keep Juniors from shuddering in the wake of the attack. Eventually, the only remaining Fazbear location closes. Then sometime in the late 1980s and early 1990s, we have the creation of Ennard and the Michael Afton AI. During the following years, William Afton is, you know, up to no good. But at least he's not actively killing anybody that we know of, anyway. He returns to the first Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, which is now boarded up, leaking, and overrun with vermin. All of the original haunted animatronics are still there, though. Freddy, Foxy, Bonnie, and Chica. Williams come back in order to destroy the original animatronics. We can assume that he has now seen how his daughter's soul is trapped in Circus Baby, and how Charlie's soul is trapped in the puppet. Now, he wants to experiment with giving life to the animatronics instead of just, you know, murdering kids for the heck of it. And so, William melts down their endoskeletons and creates Ennard, but in doing so, he also creates Remnant, the spiritual material of the children which gives the animatronic suits eternal, if not totally scary, life. Using the orange, glowy Remnant, William creates Funtime Foxy, Funtime Freddy, and Funtime Chica. Remnant also keeps the original five souls from ascending out of the animatronics. Because their souls are all, you know, tangled up, the only way to escape the suits for good is to make sure all of the suits containing Remnant are burned up entirely. William also fully intends to make good on his promise to Michael, you know, putting him back together again, so he rebuilds his son as an AI. Only, Michael is not aware that he's a robot now. What could possibly go wrong? In 1992, William Afton dies and becomes Springtrap. This next bit doesn't quite align with the Remnant combining situation, but there's plenty of evidence to support it, so I'm just gonna plow ahead. The original five souls from the first Freddy Fazbear's Pizza become free of their animatronic prisons. They chase William Afton into the safe room, leaving him with no choice but to get into the Spring Bonnie suit. The suit then malfunctions and kills him, leaving his soul to possess the Spring Bonnie suit and become Springtrap. Henry then finds the mess and walls off the safe room, not to be opened for another 30 years or so. I know there are theories out there that William is, you know, somehow still alive when he becomes Springtrap, but I don't buy it. I don't think anyone, paranormal or not, would survive 30-ish years walled up in a safe room. So while William is a little, you know, occupied, in 1993, Michael Afton returns to Circus Babies Entertainment and Rentals to save Elizabeth, his sister, on instruction from his dad. I guess that when William created the Michael Afton AI, he programmed a mission into his brain to go and rescue his sister, Elizabeth. She's still trapped in the Circus Baby animatronic playground. William has been walled off as Springtrap for the past year or so. He must have programmed Michael to save Elizabeth from the get-go. I don't really know how we would have gotten the message to Michael otherwise. But whatever, continuity aside, what matters is that the message was received. Michael's on his way to get his sister, and we get the terrifying joy of playing as Michael while Circus Baby and Ennard lead him into the scooping room. He gets scooped. It's stressful as hell. And at the end of the game, Michael looks into a mirror and sees his eyes are glowing bright purple. They're clearly Ennard or Circus Baby's eyes, but it doesn't really matter who they are because they're both hitching a ride on the Michael train out of the sister location. If you play both nights and complete all modes, you're rewarded with a series of 8-bit cutscenes that show Michael Afton happily strutting out of sister location in increasingly distressing levels of decay. Finally, when he's shirtless and purple and nobody's around to notice him, Michael Afton curls over, vomits Ennard out into the sewer, then collapses. He seems dead, but then Circus Baby's voice fills the screen as she repeats, you won't die. You won't die over and over again. Sure enough, Purple Michael gets to his feet and walks off screen, as though he's just experienced a uh, rough hangover instead of, you know, full on death. So then there's a bit of a time skip until we get to 2023, unearthing William's body and opening a new Fazbear uh, attraction, Fazbear's Fright. The cycle of death has been over for 30 years, but then a bunch of horror fans and their loyal minion, Phone Dude, not to be confused with the venerable and presumed deceased Phone Guy, have to go and ruin everything. They unearth William Afton's body, aka Springtrap, from its walled in layer in the OG Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. It's 2023, so they decide, eh, what the hell? Let's capitalize off those horrible Fazbear tragedies by turning the restaurant into a horror attraction called Fazbear's Fright. Phone Dude's super psyched to have found Springtrap, probably because he doesn't realize exactly what he's unearthed, and you have to contend with Springtrap's horrors as the Night Watchman, yet again. Fazbear's Fright eventually burns down, but <sighs> lucky us, 
Spring Trap Escapes. In 2023, Henry also builds Freddy Fazbear's Pizza Simulator to lure any remaining animatronics to the building and destroy them, erasing any history of the Freddy Fazbear company. Probably for insurance reasons, because he's a capitalist dick, but eh, whatever. So where's Henry after all this time? For a while, it just seemed like he was like, hey, cool, my murderous ex-business partner is dead in a rabbit suit, I'll just wall that up and uh, forget about it. But naturally, he's been building a fake Freddy Fazbear's Pizza location to lure in haunted animatronics and burn them down, freeing the trapped souls. And yeah, that's basically what happens. Everything burns. Except uh, that in a cutscene accessed only by beating the Saturday night shift in FNAF 6, you hear Michael's voice saying to his father, I'll find you. Well, good luck, Mikey boy, because turns out William Afton is in hell. Yep, your dad's in hell, right where we thought he'd end up. Cassidy, the one you shouldn't have killed, has created a perpetual hell, or purgatory depending on how lenient you'd like your serial killer's punishment to be, for William Afton, her murderer. She's the only remaining spirit in the suits, having been unable to get up and stroll on over to the pizzeria simulator like her comrades. She's stuck in a springlock suit without a body to control. But the look in her eyes at the ending of Ultimate Custom Night makes it seem like she's quite happy torturing William Afton for eternity. Next up, a true leaderboard classic. Our 107 facts series has always been a blast, but this one in particular seemed to catch the attention of a whole lot of folks. Like 6 million views worth. Whether that's because FNAF is inherently popular, or because lots of people just wanted to see if they could figure out what the hell was going on, that's still up in the air. Hosted by the one and only Kasich Games, this is 107 Five Nights at Freddy's Facts You Should Know. One of the most popular horror games ever created, and that's why today here at Leaderboard, we are going to be doing 107 facts about Five Nights at Freddy's. <laughs> Number 1. Five Nights at Freddy's is a point-and-click survival horror game created by Scott Cawthon. It was released on August 8th, 2014 on Desera and then 12 days later released on Steam after being greenlit. It has also been ported over to Android and iOS platforms. Number 2. Five Nights at Freddy's was created using the Click Team Fusion 2.5 engine. Number 3. FNAF has been subject to a lot of successful Let's Play videos on YouTube. This has had an influence on the game's wide success. Number 4. In addition to creating the game, Scott is the voice of Phone Guy. Number 5. FazbearEntertainments.com actually redirects to Scott's site, ScottGames.com. Number 6. Five Nights at Freddy actually happened because Scott received criticism from his last title, Chippers and Sons Lumber Co. Players ridiculed the main character and said that it looked like a scary animatronic animal. Reviewer Jim Sterling said that the game was unintentionally terrifying. While his initial reaction to this was depression, he ended up using this as fuel to create an intentional horror game. And we all know how that worked out. Number 7. In in April 2015, Warner Brothers Pictures announced that they secured the rights for the adaptation of Five Nights at Freddy's. Number 8. Markiplier is considered the king of Five Nights at Freddy's by the majority of the community. Number 9. Markiplier's Let's Play series on the game is also thought to be one of the reasons the game is so successful. Number 10. Scott is a member of Hope Animation, a project of Christian animators who aim to spread the teachings of Jesus Christ. Number 11. In all the games, if the player completes all Five Nights at Freddy's, a sixth night is unlocked. In Five Nights at Freddy's 3, Night 6 is also called Nightmare. Number 12. Upon completion of Night 6 in the first two games, a custom level editor mode is unlocked. Number 13. In the online Five Nights at Freddy's community, the most popular character is Foxy the Pirate. Number 14. The Living Tombstone has created three songs based on the series. One for each game thus far and the songs have become wildly successful. Number 15. The security guard from the first game is named Mike Schmidt. This of course is known because his name is written on the checks received on Night 5 and Night 6. Number 16. There are five animatronics in the first Five Nights at Freddy's game. Bonnie the Bunny, Chica the Chicken, Foxy the Fox, Freddy Fazbear, and Golden Freddy. Number 17. The laugh that Golden Freddy makes is actually an unedited version of Freddy's laugh when he's moving. Number 18. Freddy has hard to see handprints across his face. I wonder how they got there. Number 19. In the first game, there's a celebrate poster in your office and by clicking on Freddy's nose, yes, nose, it will play a honking sound. Number 20. In the second game, the same noise can be heard by clicking on Toy Freddy's nose. In the third, you can hear it by clicking the Freddy drawing's nose. Number 21. Five Nights at Freddy's 2 was released on Steam in November 11, 2014, earlier than his planned time frame of 2015. Number 22. Five Nights at Freddy's 2 takes place in 1987 prior to the events that happened in Five Nights at Freddy's 1. Number 23. 
date, a demo of Five Nights at Freddy's 3 was given a limited release on March 1st, 2015. Hours later, the game was fully released on March 2nd on Steam. Number 24, Five Nights at Freddy's 3 takes place 30 years after the original game and takes place in Fazbear Fright, the horror attraction. Number 25, if Nightmare Mode is completed, the player is shown a newspaper clipping that states that Freddy's Fright has burnt down. Surviving items are sold at a public auction. Number 26, brightening up the newspaper clippings reveals that Springtrap may still be alive as he can be seen in the background. Number 27, in the same newspaper clipping, blurred text can be seen surrounding the focal article. If you read carefully, there's actually some really cool information that Scott has documented. Number 28, in many of Scott's games, he has found that there has been a broken down robot. He himself has stated that he is unsure why this is a reoccurring theme in his work. But in his own words, he says, it's obvious that something is haunting me. Number 29. While Scott was working on the first game of the series, he created a crowdfunding campaign for it. It raised a whopping sum of exactly zero dollars. Sorry, Scott, we just didn't know then. We just didn't know. Number 30. Freddy, Bonnie, Chica, and Foxy were originally just placeholder nicknames that Scott was using for the characters while he was working on the development of the game, but grew attached to them and eventually used them as the actual names for the characters. Number 31. In the original game, it was Scott's plan to have Freddy be a stationary character. He would only attack when the player's power and time ran out. However, Scott changed his mind because he wanted Freddy to have more floor time and changed his AI programming to what it is now. From night three onwards, he hunts you down. Number 32. In real life, Scott tends to have walking nightmares. One night, he had a dream that Bonnie was outside of his door, so he physically jumped out of his bed, rushed to the door to hold it shut. Scott discovered that his door was already locked, which terrified him because he believed that Bonnie was lurking somewhere in inside the room. Thankfully, he woke up safe and sound. Number 33. Foxy was modeled on Scott's laptop while he was in the car riding for a 24-hour drive. This drive is to visit his in-laws in the summer of 2014. He said, and I quote, it is very difficult to model a 3D character on a bumpy car ride. Maybe this is why Foxy looks so torn up. <laughs> Poor Foxy. Number 34. While on the trip, Scott's kids got to experience Foxy's jump scare for the first time. Number 35. The name of the protagonist in Five Nights at Freddy's 2 is Jeremy Fitzgerald, as you can see on the paychecks given to you on Night 5 and Night 6. Number 36. In the custom night of Five Nights at Freddy's 2, Jeremy is replaced by Fritz Smith, who is then fired after that one single evening. Number 37. The protagonist in Five Nights at Freddy's 3 is the only protagonist not to be named in the series. I wonder why that is. Number 38. Freddy Fazbear's Pizza was originally named Fred Bear Family Diner. Number 39. The puppet is the only animatronic without teeth. Number 40. In the first night of Five Nights at Freddy's 1, the phone guy reveals that the animatronics have not been cleaned in over 20 years. Yeah. Number 41. Balloon Boy is the only animatronic that speaks using full words. Number 42. Balloon Boy is also the only animatronic who speaks with a non-distorted human voice. Number 43. In Five Nights at Freddy's 1, Mike Schmidt only gets paid $4 an hour, which roughly fits the minimum wage of the 19. 90s. Number 44. In the gameplay footage of Five Nights at Freddy's 1 that Scott uploaded to his YouTube channel, it seems that East Hall was originally going to be called Backstage. Number 45. In the same footage found on Scott's YouTube channel, the East Hall Corner was originally labeled as W Hall Corner, in addition to the actual West Hall Corner. Number 46. According to the phone guy in Five Nights at Freddy's 3, there was a secret safe room. It's for the employees and was invisible to the animatronics, unmapped and hidden from cameras. Number 47. Due to budget restrictions, the safe room has been covered by a false wall. The map of the minigame from the third game reveals that the safe room is by the bathrooms near the entrance. Number 48. The minigames in Five Nights at Freddy's 3 point to the safe room as being the location where five children were murdered. Number 49. Springtrap is the only true animatronic in Five Nights at Freddy's 3 and is also the only animatronic that can kill you. All other animatronics seen in the games are phantoms or hallucinations. Number 50. Freddy Fazbear's Pizza is actually a restaurant chain with multiple locations that is mentioned sometimes by the phone guy. Number 51. Phone guy refers to Springtrap as Spring Bonnie. Number 52. There are rare boot images for Five Nights at Freddy's 3 that seems to show human remains in Springtrap's suit. Number 53. In the first gameplay video that Scott released, the game seemed a little bit more pixelated. Number 54. In that same video, there was a graphic of a man standing with one beside him at the starting screen. Seems like Scott was planning to include 
lives at some point. Number 55. It seems that lives were also taken into consideration for the second game, based on unused content of a small bar with the word lives and a pixel stick figure. Number 56. The second game also has an unused graphic of an empty meter named Toxic. It's unknown what purpose it was going to serve. Number 57. A slightly more terrifying unused graphic shows a portion of what seems to be a skull. It has visible teeth and black streaming out of the only eye shown. Interestingly, it was named Mike, which is also the protagonist of the first game. Number 58. The laugh heard when Freddy moves is actually a slowed down audio clip of a little girl giggling. An example. <laughs> Yep, I'm a little girl. Number 59. When Freddy moves, running footsteps can be heard, which implies that he can run like Foxy. Number 60. Despite having a girlish name, Scott has confirmed that Bonnie is a male. Number 61. Scott finds Bonnie to be the most terrifying animatronic in the game. Number 62. Bonnie was also the first animatronic added to the game. Number 63. Unlike the other animatronics in the first game, Bonnie has no eyebrows. Number 64. In the trailer of the first game, Bonnie is shown running down the hallway, this later being given to Foxy. Number 65. If you pay attention, you'll notice that Foxy's ears clip into the top of the door during his jump scares in the first game. Number 66. Foxy is the only animatronic in the first game with teeth on his upper jaw. Number 67. A closer look at the drawings in Kids Cove revealed two scribbles where kids are ripping apart Mangle. Number 68. The music box in Five Nights at Freddy's 2 keeps the puppet away. It can be whined remotely, but its actual location is the prize counter. Number 69. If the music box stays unwound, you can see the puppet gradually starting to rise from the gift box. Number 70. The music box melody is a sample from Fisher Price teaching clock toy from the 1960s. Number 71. Children's drawings of the puppet depict him with handles and strings. These are noticeably absent in his appearance except when he's at the prize corner. Number 72. According to Scott, the fourth installment of Five Nights at Freddy's will be the last game in the series. With that said, Scott has confirmed that Bonnie will get a spin-off game where he goes to an amusement park with Foxy. I'm just kidding. I just want to get you excited. That'd be stupid. Hashtag Bonnie Coaster 2015. Number 73. Five Nights at Freddy's 4 is set to be released October 31st, 2015. Which means we are going to have the scariest Halloween of all time. Number 74. Five Nights at Freddy's 3 is the only game without Bonnie as an active antagonist. Number 75. Mangle is the redesigned version of Foxy meant to be more kid-friendly. Number 76. Six. Mangle is not kid friendly. That's a fact, okay? Number 77. Mangle and Foxy are the only two counterparts who can regularly occupy the same room. Number 78. If you look closely in Kid's Cove, you can see the white iris of Mangle's eye staring directly at you through the camera. Number 79. In Five Nights at Freddy's 2, there are two characters that will still attack you even if you're wearing the Freddy Fazbear head. Those two characters being the puppet and Foxy. Number 80. The puppet and its mechanics are based on the pop popular form of children's toy, Jack in the Box. Number 81. In Five Nights at Freddy's 2, once you hear Pop Goes the Weasel, be careful because that means the puppet is coming for you. Number 82. Based on a hallucination in which it appears, one can assume that the puppet is tall and lanky. It appears to stretch from the floor to the ceiling of the pizzeria. Number 83. Despite being a chicken, Chica looks quite like a duck. This has led to her fans calling her Duck or Duck Duck back in the early days of the game's release. Number 84. Scott has said that he originally planned to have Balloon Boy and the puppet make it in the first game, but they didn't make the cut. Number 85. In one call, Phone Guy suggests to play dead to keep the animatronics at bay. This led to speculation that staying still would keep you from dying, but a look at the game's code revealed otherwise. Number 86. Golden Freddy was originally just a name that fans came up with, but it was confirmed canon in the custom night mode in Five Nights at Freddy's 2. Number 87. The electric static coming from Mangle is telemetry from an unmade drone. You can even hear a few words spoken by the drone's controller. Number 88. Before his name was revealed to be Springtrap, fans referred to him as Golden Bonnie, Salvage, Franken Bonnie, and Mr. Twitchy. I kind of like Mr. Twitchy the best. Number 89. Before Five Nights at Freddy's 3 was released, Scott jokingly made a post saying that the game had been canceled because someone had leaked the game fully online. What he was referring to is actually a copy of There Is No Play Button, the game that Scott previously created with Freddy's face 
plays plastered onto the sprite. As you play, the troll song continuously plays in the background. Number 90. Following the reveal of Five Nights at Freddy's 4, fans noticed that the HTML of the game's site was littered with 8s and 7s. While some took it as a reference to the Bite of 87, some people took the numbers as coordinates. They plugged them into a map and I kid you not, found a pizzeria. Fans then decided to call the pizzeria and bomb them with questions about Five Nights at Freddy's the crazy thing is, this was just an uncanny coincidence. Scott actually had to make his first Reddit post ever, begging his fans to leave the poor pizzeria alone. That's just amazing. Number 91. In the trailer for Five Nights at Freddy's, Bonnie removes his mask to reveal his endoskeleton. In the final version of the game, none of the animatronics do this. This may be because it's against the rules for an animatronic to be without its costume. Number 92. Scott has released a series of terrifying teaser images for Five Nights at Freddy's four that depict terrifying versions of the animatronics. Scary, 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 snake tongue. Automatically scary. Number 93. In mobile versions of the game, the animatronics are more aggressive than their PC counterparts. Number 94. Also, in the mobile version of Five Nights at Freddy's, the nights are shorter. Number 95. In the first Five Nights at Freddy's game, the animatronics come after you alphabetically. Number 96. The bare endoskeleton in Five Nights at Freddy's 2 has a head that closely resembles MIT's Kismet Robot. Number 97. Bonnie and Chica both travel through the dining area in the first game. If you compare their appearances in that space, Bonnie appears to be a lot taller than Chica. Number 98. In other appearances, they seem to be the same scale, so this might have been an oversight. Number 99. If you pay attention, you can notice differences in the endoskeletons of the toy animatronics and the original ones. Toy animatronics have a different mouth and a more protective frame. We made it! Number 100! In the third game, booting an individual system takes five seconds. Booting them all takes eight to nine seconds. This can save you time, but sometimes it allows Springtrap to reach you even if he's all the way across the building. So weigh your options carefully. Number 101. It's funny how Jeremy can shine a flashlight in the third game's rooms and brighten them up. He's not physically in any of these spaces, and we all know pointing a flashlight at a monitor or a camera doesn't quite work like that. It could be that each camera has a light attached to it that can be active access remotely, but with that said, why does it drain your flashlight battery power? Long story short, the flashlight mechanics don't make much sense. Or maybe we as a community read too much into everything. Number 102. In one month on YouTube, Five Nights at Freddy's as a whole had received over 1 billion views. That's pretty crazy. Number 103. Are you sick of listening to the phone guy? Well, did you know that in all three games, you can mute him by hitting the mute call button? I'm sure that was the fact you guys were all waiting for. Number 104. In the first and third game, the phone calls get shorter and shorter as the nights progress. Number 105. As mentioned earlier, the extra menu in the third game includes something called mini games. Interestingly enough, the happiest day mini game that is present in game is not accessible through the menu. Number 106. Scott's website warns fans to beware of impersonators. He doesn't have an active Twitch or Twitter account. People lying on the internet? No way! And finally, number 107! In the first game, whenever Foxy bangs on the door, a portion of the player's power drains. It starts at 1%, but increases by 5% every time he comes by. Why have 107 facts when you can have 214? With a series as deep and complex as FNAF, it only makes sense to come back for seconds. Just make sure everybody gets their firsts before you go back up, okay? Sorry. Pizza Party flashbacks. Hitting 6 million views once again, Freddy just keeps bringing the heat. It's time for 107 Five Nights at Freddy's Facts You Should Know, Part 2. For years now, Scott Cawthon and his gang of creepy animatronics have taken the internet by frightful storm, thrilling YouTubers and avid gamers alike. With every new entry in the series, the world of Five Nights at Freddy's grows with ever more complex story arcs and disturbing characters, making us all quick to jump and reject those birthday invitations to Chuck E. Cheese. Hi, I'm Adam, and here at the leaderboard, we're giving you another 107 facts about Five Nights at Freddy's. As if the first 107 didn't leave you scarred enough already, let's get started. <laughs> Thank you.
fact number one. Scott Cawthon, the creator of Five Nights at Freddy's, wasn't a known name until the game's imminent success. Before producing Five Nights at Freddy's, Cawthon worked on obscure Christian games, and even as a cashier at Dollar General. The success of the eerie point and click has changed Scott Cawthon's life for the better. He is a cashier no more. Number two. Success doesn't always have a direct link to happiness. Due to the success of Five Nights at Freddy's, Cawthon now works under the dire eye of the public, which hasn't been all too kind to him. Cawthon states that he's always stressed due to the harsh criticism from the general gaming community, and he finds that people tend to hate on him and his games simply due to the success. Number three. However, despite being a huge success, Cawthon uses his achievement with Five Nights at Freddy's responsibly. For instance, he donated $250,000 to St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital during the fundraising drive. Number four. Five Nights at Freddy's continues development in Click Team Fusion 2.5. That includes all four games in the main series. Can you believe it's been only two years since the first game? Number five. If you ever need that extra ounce of fright on the road, all the games in the main series, Five Nights at Freddy's 1, 2, 3, and 4 are available on mobile ports. But remember, don't play Five Nights at Freddy's and drive! Number six. Coffin has gone on to say that he is currently talking with companies to make a console port possible. Whether this will be a simple port or a remake for consoles remains unknown. Number seven. Freddy's name was originally going to be Freddy Bear, as seen in the original Kickstarter, which also reveals that his name is based off of Teddy Bear. Number eight. Speaking of the Kickstarter, the Five Nights at Freddy's Kickstarter was an absolute failure. Asking for a mere $10,000, the Kickstarter earned a whopping zero dollars. However, this could be thanks to Cawthon canceling the Kickstarter only days after he launched it. Number nine. When developing the AI for the animatronics, Cawthon didn't have animations for the death screens at first, only a still image. However, despite being just a still image, he managed to scare himself and the rest of us with the classic tool of foreboding horror. Number 10. Ever have trouble remembering the animatronics' names? Well, all you have to do is remember that each name is a play on the animal that the animatronic is based on. Bonnie is Bunny, Chica is Chicken, and Foxy is Fox. The only animatronic to break this naming scheme is Freddy Fazbear. Number 11. The newspaper featured in the intro of Five Nights at Freddy's misspells pizzeria as pizzaria. Number 12. In that same newspaper, the text around the circled ad is littered with random text written by Coffin. Number 13. Using the power of math, Redditor Left Out XYZ calculated the speed at which Foxy runs down the hall. 13.7 meters a second. However, However, when you really think about it, time in the Five Nights at Freddy's world works in a very strange way. Number 14. Foxy actually sings in-game. If you switch to the camera in the Pirate's Cove, you can hear it clearly. Number 15. Foxy's animation when coming into the office can be interrupted mid-animation if the power goes out. The chances of that are slim, of course, so don't count on that to save your hide. Number 16. While Freddy can seemingly teleport into the office even when the doors are closed, it's confirmed that Golden Freddy actually can. Number 17. Golden Freddy doesn't have any reflection when he appears in the office, leading many to assume that he's actually a hallucination, or even a ghost. Number 18. Golden Freddy can be triggered to appear in the game if you set the AI levels to 1, 9, 8, and 7. This, of course, is a reference to the Bite of 87, a general event featured in the series. Number 19. Phone Guy's lovely and informative phone call to the player is replaced with random gargling. When reversed, it sounds as though the speaker is reading an excerpt from the book Autobiography of a Yogi. Number 20. The game's 2020 2020 or 420 setting was initially thought impossible by Cawthon himself. However, YouTuber slash Twitch streamer Biggs Bugs proved him wrong, prompting Cawthon to add a third star to the title screen. Number 21. Unlike the other animatronics, encountering Golden Freddy in the office will result in the game crashing. Spooky. Number 22. The song Freddy plays before your imminent demise is the Toreador March. Should be called the Terrifying March, am I right? <laughs> Number 23. An unused graphic suggests that the pizzeria map used in Five Nights at Freddy's was originally going to be more detailed. The design indicates more precise locations for each camera and where cameras were going to be placed. This was all changed for the final game. Number 24. During Five Nights at Freddy's pre-release period, players were given a set number of lives. As most of you learn the hard way, the final release got rid of these lives, and the game ends up getting caught once. Number 25. The sound each of the animatronics makes after reaching the player seems to be 
an edited version of a child's scream. Since the game cuts off part of the audio, the game's files reveal the entire length of the scream, if you care to pee your own pants. Go! Number 26. Remember when I mentioned earlier that I've been avoiding Chuck E. Cheese birthday bashes for the past three years? Well, Five Nights at Freddy's coincidentally fits the true story in which a former employee murdered four people and injured another at Chuck E. Cheese restaurant in 1993. This has led some to believe that each animatronic matches the circumstances of each real-life victim. Number 27. Now you already know that Mike Schmidt's paycheck at the end of Night 5 is a mere $120. Well, if you decide to work at Night 5, you can earn a whopping 50 cents for overtime. Yep, the struggle is real. Number 28. Mike Schmidt's check dates 11 12 XX. The only Fridays that fall on that date are 1993, 1999, and 2004. Number 29. Just like in the first game, Bonnie and Chica travel through the left and right sides respectively. You know what they say you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Number 30. The surrounding text for the newspaper featuring the grand reopening article contains the same filler text used in the Help Wanted ad in the first game. Number 31. The purple guy serves a significant role in the Five Nights at Freddy's series, but unfortunately, due to the limitations of the mobile games, his appearances have been slimmed down significantly. The only mobile port to feature Purple Guy prominently is Five Nights at Freddy's 2, whereas Five Nights at Freddy's 3 relegates him to only the rare boot screens. Number 32. There still isn't a great understanding to who Purple Guy is. In several games, he is seen inside the Fazbear locations, leading fans to believe that he is definitely a worker in the facility. Many fans claim that the Purple Guy is the man you've been listening to the whole time, the phone guy. Number 33. Fritz Smith is the only protagonist in the entire series to work for only one night canonically. Maybe if he was at a better job, he'd be given more hours because $24 just doesn't cut it. Number 34. A user by the name of Pop Goes the Weasel discovered that the termination pink slip seen at the end of the custom night in the second Five Nights at Freddy's is actually just a simple stock image. Number 35. The promotional material for Five Nights at Freddy's 2 said that it was a grand reopening. It was probably done to throw players off since it's now widely known that the game takes place in 1987, making the game a prequel. Number 36. In the mobile version of the game, clicking on Freddy's nose won't result in a hump. For some reason, this little Easter egg was removed. Number 37. A little detail you might notice about Toy Freddy is his mouth. The closer he gets to the player, the more his mouth hangs open. Number 38. If you pay close attention to Toy Bonnie's eyes, you might notice that he actually has eyebrows. Number 39. Toy Bonnie is the only animatronic that moves when he enters the office. The game's engine which runs Five Nights at Freddy's 2 makes it difficult to coordinate movements, so the character's actions are limited. Number 40. One of the party rooms in Five Nights at Freddy's 2 has three paper plate figurines hanging on the wall. If you pay close attention to them, you'll notice that one of them goes missing. This missing figure will sometimes reappear in your office. Number 41. There's a theory that states that Toy Bonnie is the one that removes the paper plate figurine from the wall. When Toy Bonnie is in the room, his head blocks your view of that particular paper plate. When he leaves, the paper plate will go missing. Number 42. In a Five Nights at Freddy's 2 teaser image featuring Foxy and Mangle, you can see that Mangle still has her hook. In the game, the hook is not present. Number 43. The missing rock may be attributed to children taking apart and putting Mangle together again. Number 44. Mangle's gender is never fully revealed. When asked what gender Mangle is, creator Scott Cawthon gave a very definitive answer. Yes. Number 45. The puppet's difficulty level can't be altered in the custom mode. That's because the puppet's actions are dependent on how you play the game. Number 46. In addition to the seven nights you get in Five Nights at Freddy's 2, there's also a secret eighth night in the game. Number 47. Sometimes, I get a little distracted looking at the little plush toys in the prize room. Those toys are the same toys you can buy in the mobile version of the first Five Nights at Freddy's. Number 48. Failing to wind up the music box releases the marionette, but if you check the prize room, there's also a chance an endoskeleton will pop up. Granted that the marionette hasn't killed you yet. Number 49. In the vein of Golden Freddy, Five Nights at Freddy's 2 introduces Shadow Freddy as a secret antagonist. When you look into the parts and service room, Shadow Freddy will appear sitting down in the same location where Bonnie starts. Number 50. Staring at Shadow Freddy for too long will cause the game to crash. Again, in the same vein as Golden Freddy. Number 51. Another Shadow character is a black silhouette of Bonnie. Similar to Shadow Freddy, staring at this Bonnie for too long will cause the game to, you guessed it, crash. Number 52. This Shadow Bonnie character returns in Five Nights at Freddy's 3 as RWK... 
but I, I can't read this. You know, I think I like the name Shadow Bonnie better. Number 53. Springtrap is the only suit to have five fingers, similar to humans. This is due to the fact that it's one of the only animatronics to have a suit mode allowing humans to wear it. Number 54. When Springtrap runs halfway across the hallway in front of you, you don't see anything below his waist. Number 55. When looking at the standalone files, you can see that his legs don't actually move. Number 56. The purple guy was accidentally stuffed inside Springtrap. This can be seen towards the end of the game, where it's revealed in a mini-game that the purple guy hid inside Spring Bonnie. Number 57. In the trailer for Five Nights at Freddy's 3, there's a scene where Springtrap is twitching on the ground. This is eerily similar to Purple Guy's death scene in the Night 5 minigame, leading to the theory that we, the viewers, are actually witnessing the Purple Guy's death. Number 58. When you boot up Five Nights at Freddy's 3, you might encounter one of the three boot screens revealing very disturbing images. These images feature Springtrap and what looks like to be human remains inside the suit. Number 59. These human remains are visible in-game as well. When Springtrap gets into the room from the right side, he opens his mouth for a second. If you look really closely, you can see someone's jaw and a mouth full of missing teeth. Number 60. If you take a peek at Cam 2 or Cam 10, sometimes it will show posters of Springtrap instead of our lovable bear, Freddy. Number 61. Before Springtrap's name was revealed, fans were put into full speculation mode. The Five Nights at Freddy's 3 promo featuring the spare parts of past animatronics had led fans to thinking that Springtrap would use those parts to rebuild himself. Therefore, fans dubbed him Hybrid. Number 62. Golden Freddy even appears in the camera feed. Just don't blink or you'll miss him. Number 63. Mangle also makes a return. You can encounter Mangle peering through the window or in your camera feed, but the best part is the screen. Number 64. Five Nights at Freddy's 3's bad ending screen shows us some familiar faces. Freddy, Foxy, Chica, Bonnie, and wait, wait, who's that in the back? Number 65. The good ending on the other hand, only shows us Freddy, Foxy, Chica, and Bonnie. Number 66. There's an unused title card for a seventh night found hiding within the game's files, meaning that we could have had a whole week at Freddy's. Number 67. If you're in one of Five Nights at Freddy's 3's mini games and you're feeling adventurous, you can stray off the beaten path and find a room filled with animatronic parts. You can see the animatronic suits and endoskeletons littering the floor, but there's also a human skull. Number 68. One of the mini games features nine rooms, nearly identical identical to another. I say nearly identical because while eight of the rooms contain three children watching the stage, one of the rooms has two children. Is this child missing or were they just left out? Number 69. The first promo image for Five Nights at Freddy's 3 features Balloon, but what's mysterious about this image is the number 10. Coffin stated that there were originally going to be 10 promo images leading up to the release of the game. However, Coffin released Five Nights at Freddy's 3 early, resulting in the release of only one image. Number 70. There are times when an alternate alternatively colored balloon boy might appear under your desk to jump scare you. Fans suspect that this might be an entirely different entity, with some even referring to the child as Balloon Girl. Number 71. The Fazbear's Fright security guard's name is never revealed. You never receive a paycheck due to the burning down of the attraction. Number 72. Five Nights at Freddy's 4 was released on July 23rd, 2015, for everyone's frightening pleasure. Number 73. The game was originally going to be released on October 31st, 2015, but Coffin got in contact with many Five Nights at Freddy's players on YouTube informing them that the date was changed. This new date was August 8th of the same year, the release anniversary of the first game. However, Coffin suddenly and unexpectedly released the full game on Steam on July 23rd. To explain his actions, he told the public he just wasn't good with release dates. Number 74. Five Nights at Freddy's 4 was originally dubbed The Final Chapter. However, as time went by, the subtitle was dropped to a simple 4. Maybe Coffin had a feeling he would make more. Number 75. If you watched 107 Facts on Five Nights at Freddy's, you might remember us mentioning that the pizzeria was bombarded with calls after fans found its existence through Google Maps. Turns out the owner of the pizzeria caught on to the hype and offered a Fazbear's Pizzeria special for a limited time. Number 76. Five Nights at Freddy's 4 takes a lot of the series' long-standing game mechanics and series staples and throws them out the window. For one, Five Nights at Freddy's 4 does not take place in any Freddy-related location, instead taking place in the protagonist's house. Number 77. High-tech gadgets? You can say bye to those. Five Nights at Freddy's 4 is the first and currently only game in the series to not feature a monitor. Yep, you can't rely on cameras this time around. Number 78. There are no rare boot images to be found in Five Nights at Freddy's 4, so don't even try looking for them. Number 79. In a minigame following the completion of Night 2, the player is prompted to walk left in order to escape a room. However, if you decide to go right, you can see the purple guy helping someone fit 
inside the spring lock suit, number 80. If you look towards the protagonist's bedside table, you'll see flowers, pills, and an IV drip. Sounds like a hospital bedside if you ask me. Many on the internet think that your character might be in a coma during the events of the game. Number 81. If you don't want to be spoiled, skip this fact, because there will indeed be possible spoilers. At the end of Five Nights at Freddy's 4, there's a little cutscene involving a child and little toy versions of the animatronics. If you listen closely, you can hear a heart monitor flatline. This actually supports the theory that your character might be in a coma, and the flatline indicates that they possibly passed away at the end of the game. Number 82. The minigame following Night 3 takes you to a living room with a television. When the television turns on, it runs on a show called Fred Bear and Friends. What's important is the year below the show title. It says 1983. Could this be the year that the game is set in? Or is this just a rerun of the year 1983? Number 83. The phone guy from the first Five Nights at Freddy's returns. Somewhat. Sounds are very important in Five Nights at Freddy's 4. One particular sound is static noise. Reversing the static reveals the voice of the phone guy. It's even the first phone call you receive from the game. Number 84. After beating the game on Nightmare Mode, a locked suitcase appears. It's a mystery as to what's inside the case since, to this day, no one's managed to open it. Number 85. Using the game's source code, Redditor GobbleMyPot says that the code accounts for a possibility of it opening and reveals something called Deep Nine. Number 86. Despite the game having the most animatronics in the series, nearly all of them aren't actually physically present. They're figments of the main character's imagination. Nightmares, if you will. Number 87. Each of the nightmare animatronics feature five fingers, instead of the standard four that most animatronics actually have. Number 88. In promotional images for Five Nights at Freddy's 4, Nightmare Freddy is the only animatronic whose name isn't revealed. Number 89. Nightmare Freddy is the only Freddy iteration not to carry a microphone. Come on, Nightmare Freddy, old pal. You gotta keep up with the trend. Number 90. Nightmare Freddy's little Freddy-looking pals were named Freddles, also known as Fredlets, by fans. This name was canonized in the Five Nights at Freddy's world, where one of the Nightmare Freddy's attacks, in which he unleashes a horde of mini-me's, is named Freddles. Number 91. Nightmare Bonnie, like Bonnie in Five Nights at Freddy's 1 and Old Bonnie in Five Nights at Freddy's 2, travels down the left side of the main character. Seems like Bonnie likes to keep the trend going, unlike Freddy, who can't even keep his mic on hand. Number 92. Although rare, it's possible to finish the night while in the middle of the Nightmare Bonnie jump scare. Number 93. Nightmare Chica also keeps the trend going, traveling towards the player's right side. Number 94. Plush Trap, the adorable little version of Springtrap, is the only animatronic that doesn't have the word Nightmare as part of its name. Number 95. The name Plush Trap was found using one of the teaser images on scottgames.com and skimming through the source code. Players decrypted some code and it revealed the word, or rather name, Plush Trap. Number 96. Plush Trap was the first animatronic to appear in its own minigame. Number 97. Five Nights at Freddy's 4 is the first game in the series to receive updates, seen with the Halloween update released on October 30th, 2015. Number 98. The Halloween update is non-canon, but adds several cosmetic changes to make the game feel a little different. Some animatronics in the game get reskinned. Jack O'Bonnie, for example. Nightmare versions of characters seen in previous games also make an appearance, such as a nightmare version of the puppet, named Nightmariani, and Nightmare Balloon Boy. Number 99. In September 2015, Cawthon announced that there would be a new game featuring characters from the Five Nights at Freddy's universe. This game became known as Five Nights at Freddy's World. Number 100. Five Nights at Freddy's World is a spin-off of a new canon connection to the mainline games in the series. Cawthon considered the main arc of the Five Nights at Freddy's series over at Five Nights at Freddy's 4. Number 101. Even for a spin-off, Cawthon continued his tradition of being absolutely messy with his release dates. Originally intended for a February 2nd, 2016 release, the game's release was rescheduled to January 22nd, then officially released on January 21st. Number 102. Five Nights at Freddy's World's release was all but smooth. The game indeed released on January 21st, but was immediately removed from Steam and other digital storefronts due to being unfinished and unpolished. After further working on the game, Cawthon would then find a home for Five Nights at Freddy's World on Game Jolt as freeware. Number 103. The gameplay of Five Nights at Freddy's World greatly differs from the rest of the game in the Five Nights at Freddy's series. Instead of a survival horror game, Cawthon opted in for a colorful RPG. Number 104. As seen in the credits, there are a total of seven voice actors helping voice several creatures in the game. This is the largest amount of voice actors ever featured in a Five Nights at Freddy's game, since most of the voices in previous games were provided by Cawthon himself. Number 105. Debbie Derryberry, the voice of Jimmy Neutron, voices the final boss, Chica's Magic Rainbow. Number 106. Looks like the series isn't over just yet. In April 2016, Scott Cawthon revealed Five Nights at Freddy's sister location, the next game in the Five Nights at Freddy's series. Number 107. 
On May 21st, a month later, Sister Location had its first official trailer, featuring a new location and animatronics. Let's keep racking up those facts, just so long as you're not scared, yeah? There's always more lore to dissect, and each new game brings fascinating revelations to the forefront. So what's another 107 facts between friends? We're friends, right? Let's watch 107 Five Nights at Freddy's Facts That You Should Know, Part 3. It's been a while since we here at the leaderboard bombarded you with facts about Five Nights at Freddy's. And since then, Scott's cranked out a ton more content. So today, we're bringing you 107 more facts, again, on FNAF. This time primarily focusing on Ultimate Custom Night, FNAF VR Help Wanted, and the Curse of Dreadbear DLC. And of course, we'll briefly talk about the still hotly anticipated feature film. It's me, Marcus with the leaderboard, and let's jump scare to it. Number 1. Although Ultimate Custom Night seems like it would have all the animatronics from the series, it's actually missing quite a few notable examples. This includes withered versions of Foxy and Freddy, phantom versions of Foxy and the Puppet, Jack O'Bonnie, Yendo, and more. Funtime Freddy is replaced by Molten Freddy. Number 2. The roster for Ultimate Custom Night was programmed one by one and revealed incrementally on Scott's website. Three joke characters were teased for April Fool's Day. These characters were Nightmare Freddy, Foxy, and Phone Guy, and their mechanics were inspired by debunked fan theories. Number 3. April Fool's Foxy would dash into the room and actually help you by blocking a door or by giving you a little extra power. This is a throwback to when fans theorized Foxy in FNAF 1 was just trying to run to the room to check up on you, but accidentally gives you a heart attack when he shows up at your door. Number 4. April Fool's Day Nightmare Freddy showed up with an alarm clock, and if you pressed it in time, you'd wake up safe in your bed. Well, at least until you resumed your slumber. Number 5. April Fool's Phone Guy would have been unable to call if Springtrap was in the vents because he can't be in two places at the same time. This references the fact that Phone Guy and Purple Guy were once thought of as the same character. A million FNAF theorists cried out in anguish when Scott removed all three characters characters from the roster the following day. Number 6. Ultimate Custom Night was the first game to officially call Phone Guy, Phone Guy. Previously he was nameless, but Scott officially adopted the nickname for the character by the 8th title. Number 7. In Ultimate Custom Night, Springtrap can only try to attack once per night, through the vents. This is interesting, as it's the complete opposite of his behavior in FNAF 3, where he was the only real threat and would show up constantly throughout the evening. Number 8. Mr. Hippo has the longest death screens in the game by far, with rambling monologues poking fun at FNAF theorists. Oh, and they're also completely unskippable. Even turning off the game doesn't help. They'll just resume as soon as you reboot. Number 9. Unlike other mediocre melodies, Happy Frog is one animatronic completely immune to the heater within the ducts. It's theorized that this is because frogs are cold-blooded. Number 10. All of Pigpatch's death one-liners are accompanied by a banjo tune. This coupled with a southern accent could make his character an ode to the movie Deliverance. Gross. Number 11. Orville is considered the smartest and most difficult mediocre melody to deal with in Ultimate Custom Night. He's only fooled by the audio cue 10% of the time. An elephant never forgets, you know, how to maim you. Number 12. Despite being, you know, the Music Man, Music Man is actually extremely sound sensitive, and making too much noise will trigger his attack in Ultimate Custom Night. Number 13. Music Man's voice actor, Matthew Curtis, actually came out with a bunch of performances as Music Man, including Sound of Silence and Put on a Happy Face. That is pure gold. Number 14. Lefty always shushes the player after killing them for some reason. He must hate noise nearly as much as the Music Man. Number 15. Adventure Endo 1, a FNAF World character, was set to appear in Ultimate Custom Night, but was removed along with Candy Cadet. Candy Cadet made a cameo as a decoration, but Adventure Endo 1 is still completely absent. Number 16. Keeping a certain animatronic in Ultimate Custom Night on a low level doesn't necessarily mean they'll stay that way. See, DD can show up and increase a character's level or summon a new one, including six that are exclusive to her. R, W, Q, F, S, F, A, S, X, C, Bonnet, Plush Trap, Nightmare Chica, Lolbit, and Mini Rinas. Number 17. Using the death coin on level 1 Golden Freddy with no other animatronic active results in instant death. What a delightful easter egg! Number 18. There's an easter egg in the Old Man Consequences minigame of Ultimate Custom Night. If you set Old Man Consequences level to 1, with all other animatronics set to 0, you'll be transported to his fishing pond and can drown yourself. Fun. Number 19. Drowning yourself in the Old Man Consequences minigame actually affects the save file of a previous game, FNAF World, by unlocking the drowning ending. Number 20. The toughest FNAF challenge ever concocted is the 50-20 mode of Ultimate Custom Night, where all 50 animatronics AI is set to the max level of 20. The select few who have accomplished 50-20 were rewarded with a Golden Freddy statue on the home screen. Obviously, you know, the ultimate completion bonus. Number 21. The streamer, Remory, is the first known player to beat 50-20. He accomplished the monstrous task about two weeks after the game's release. Number 22. Scott surprised us with an early release for Ultimate Custom Night, moving the release up from August 2018 to June 27, 2018, because he never pulled that trick before. Number 23. Scott waited for FNAF YouTuber Daco to come back from vacation though, but a guy. 
Otherwise, he would have released it even earlier. Number 24. In 5020 mode, Shadow DD, also known as XOR, replaces DD and appears even if DD repel is used. She summons her entire roster one by one. Number 25. Unfortunately, Ultimate Custom Knight is the first mainline FNAF game that currently doesn't feature a mobile port. So now, I need a new excuse for screaming on the bus. Number 26. Fortunately, the game was released on Steam absolutely free, like Pizzeria Simulator the year prior, though that was disguised as a fan game, so Scott gets more props for his generosity this time. Number 27. Ultimate Custom Knight was originally intended to be DLC for Pizzeria Simulator, but this ambitious project quickly grew into a standalone release of its own, complete with its own lore. Number 28. Trash and the gang all make a return in Ultimate Custom Knight. Almost all. Sadly, Pan Stan is missing the party. Oh, poor Pan Stan. I know I didn't mention him when I talked about missing animatronics, but number 29. Trash and the gang technically aren't animatronics. See, there's nothing electronic or animated about them. Well, except for Mr. Hugs, because a vacuum cleaner could technically be an animatronic, I guess. Number 30. RWQFSFASXC, also known as RXQ, is a character that hasn't been seen since FNAF 2 when he was just known as Shadow Bonnie, a pitch dark version of Toy Bonnie. Matching its appearance, RXQ makes the room dark for 10 seconds and you cannot avoid this hallucination. Number 31. Ned Bear is a clear ripoff of Freddy Fazbear's design and Fred Bear's name. Like all knockoffs, he's cheaper and has thinner wiring. Perhaps due to him being such a knockoff, he's the only mediocre melody that was able to cause a lawsuit back in Pizzeria Simulator. He can be warded off with a heater or audio in the vents in Ultimate Custom Night and acknowledges he's merely a secondary character in his death speech. Come on, confidence, Ned. Number 32. The only non-canon enemies that appear in Ultimate Custom Night are Nightmare Mangle, Nightmare Annette, Jacko Chica, Dee Dee, and Old Man Consequences. They're non-canon as they appear in the FNAF Halloween DLC and FNAF World, two entities that don't take place within the lore reality. Number 33. Plush Trap has always been skittish. To avoid his jump scare in Ultimate Custom Night, you must stare at him through the camera while he's chilling in his chair. Just keep staring until he gets frightened or, you know, you make things awkward and he leaves. This mirrors his behavior in FNAF 4, as he never attacks while being watched. Number 34. Phantom Mangle and Phantom Balloon Boy in Ultimate Custom Night act pretty much exactly the same as they do in FNAF 3. They will jump scare, but not kill the player, instead causing audio and visual distortion. You know, I bring this up because I'm still salty that the game throws in jump scares that aren't even punishment for losing. They just happen. Number 35. Conversely, Phantom Freddy is the opposite in Ultimate Custom Night compared to FNAF 3. In FNAF 3, you have to ignore him to avoid a jump scare, while Ultimate Custom Night has you shining your light on him to avoid a spooking. Pretty sneaky, Scott. Number 36. Withered Chica and Withered Bunny weren't originally supposed to be in Ultimate Custom Night, but ultimately Scott threw them in while taking out Candy Cadet and Adventure N01. Number 37. Despite claiming to have a roster of 50 animatronics, Ultimate Custom Night actually has over 60, though only 50 are customizable. That 50 doesn't include DD and her summons, nor does it count the different members of Trash and the gang. Plus, there are more characters littered around that don't harm or distract you. Number 38. Rockstar Chica has absolutely no interest in frivolous lawsuits. To stop her from entering the office in Ultimate Custom Night, you simply need to remind her of the wet floor. She's deathly afraid of slipping. I don't really know how she moves silently with those maracas, though. Number 39. Toy Freddy does not actively pursue the player as he's retired. Instead, he plays a video game throughout the night and will only attack out of rage if he loses his game. It's theorized that he's retired as a way for Scott to explain to fans that Toy Freddy isn't all that important to the series or the lore. Number 40. Rockstar Foxy is unique in that the higher level you set him, the less likely it is he'll appear. See, his parrot gives you a prize if you click it in time, but this comes with the chance of Rockstar Foxy killing you instead. This risk of death is also increased the higher the level, so play care Carefully. Number 41. Nightmare Freddy and the Freddles were initially conceived as separate customizable antagonists in Ultimate Custom Night's early teasers. However, they were combined into one entity for the final release. Number 42. Golden Freddy was the first character to be put into Ultimate Custom Night according to Scott's website's programming status bar, which, as stated before, revealed these characters incrementally leading up to the release. Number 43. Although one of the original game's animatronics, Foxy was actually the last animatronic to be programmed into Ultimate Custom Night according to the programming bar. Though it should be noted, the programming bar only signified the 50 customizable animatronics. Number 44. El Chip, the rival Mexican beaver animatronic, bears a striking resemblance to Scott's previous creation, Chipper, from Chipper and Sons Lumber Company, a game whose character criticism helped lead to the creation of FNAF due partly to Chipper's creepy appearance. Number 45. Does Ultimate Custom Night give you too many options? Don't really know where to start? Well, don't worry. There are 16 preset challenges in the game, including Ladies' Night, Creepy Crawlies, and Chaos? That can't be good. Number 46. The reveal of FNAF Help Wanted was marred in mild controversy. The teaser image revealed on Scott's website featured artwork of animatronics that was likely traced from fan-made artwork. Scott apologized and removed the artwork within hours. Number 47. The original teaser contained few hidden phrases. Don't listen to them. We let something inside. It was an accident. And remember Jeremy. Number 48. The teaser also contained links to images, most of which seemed to be screenshots from the game. However, one of the photos contained an unidentifiable animatronic shot with camera shoddy work. This left fans to speculate that it was a picture of a prop from 
in the upcoming FNAF movie, number 49. Scott himself makes a cameo in FNAF Help Wanted, as his picture is shown when Hand Unit talks about the lunatic that made up all the negative press and rumors about murderous animatronics within Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, number 50. Additionally, it's later explained in the game that Fazbear Entertainment hired an irrelevant game designer, <coughs> Scott, to create indie video games based on the real pizzeria murders and disappearances in order to discredit the rumors. But wouldn't that just garner more attention? Whatever, it's meta and I dig it. Number 51. Collecting all Faz tokens throughout Help Wanted hidden in diverse locations grants you the ultimate reward. A basket of exotic butters. This is a throwback to FNAF sister location. Number 52. But some of those coins are pretty hard to uncover. For example, you have to feed Chica some pizza to reveal one, and in the FNAF 2 reimagining, you have to let the puppet attack you. So, I suppose a deathless 100% speed run of Help Wanted is impossible. Sorry, GDQ. Number 53. Not only is FNAF Help Wanted the first FNAF game on consoles, it's the first FNAF game made by a development team outside of Scott, Steel Wool Studios. Of course, Scott obviously was still a huge part of development. Number 54. Additionally, VR Help Wanted is the first FNAF game not developed on Click Team Fusion 2.5's engine, the team instead opting for the Unreal Engine 4. You had a good run, Click Team Fusion 2.5. Number 55. Fans have always joked that Chica is obsessed with pizza. Help Wanted supported this headcanon by showcasing Chica eagerly approaching a pizza box and pizza party, and having a bit of Zaz stuck to her body in parts and services. Number 56. However, after eating all that pizza with no way to, uh, you know, pass it, Chica's pizza-filled body is completely festering with cockroaches and parts and services. Number 57. Glitch Trap is referred to as the Anomaly by Tape Girl in the game, and otherwise isn't named at all in Help Wanted, but files within the game refer to the entity as both Glitch Trap and Spring Bonnie Man. Number 58. However, a different file named Glitch Trap contains images of a silvery spring trap, which shows up in Vent Repair. Fans have speculated that this was a misnamed file, but I'm thinking it's just Scott being a sneaky Scott. Number 59. Before fans data mined Glitch Trap's name, he was referred to with nicknames like VR Rabbit and my personal favorite pun, Malhair. He will forever be Malhair to me. Number 60. Glitch Trap's voice, if you could call it that, is actually comprised of distorted audio clips of Tape Girl saying, Hello, can you hear me? Perhaps these two are even more closely linked than we originally thought. Number 61. The remakes of previous titles within Help Wanted are missing a few animatronics due to the changes in gameplay. For example, Golden Freddy doesn't appear at all in the FNAF 1 and 2 VR reimagining, which makes sense in FNAF 2 as there is no Night 6 in Help Wanted. Number 62. Additionally, Phantom Puppet and Phantom Chica are missing from the FNAF 3 reimagining. Number 63. The Showtime button featured in Help Wanted still doesn't work, even with Curse of Dreadbear being released. Perhaps its purpose will be revealed in a future DLC, or perhaps it won't, like FNAF 4's box. Number 64. FNAF VR Help Wanted is the first FNAF game to receive a rating by the ESRB as it's the first widely released title. It was given a T for teen, because FNAF players are clearly all 13 or older, right? Number 65. The implementation of VR allowed for all sorts of increased mobility and sight in the reimaginings of previous titles. For example, in FNAF 1, you can now peek out of the office, prompting Foxy to charge you more quickly. And you can finally see the back of the office, revealing yellow lockers. How exciting. Number 66. The FNAF 2 reimagining featured quite a few changes. For one, there's no longer a flashlight. Instead, there are a few different light buttons on the desk. Additionally, most original withered animatronics have been saved for the special withered blacklight level. Number 67. I said most withered animatronics because original model Foxy remains in the regular levels, but not the withered version. Instead, they used his model from FNAF 1 there, creating all sorts of timeline inconsistencies. Number 68. 395248, the code needed in original FNAF 3 to unlock the minigame stage 01 and the good ending, can be used in Help Wanted's reimagining imagining to reveal a fast token. Number 69. In the FNAF 3 reimagining, the character Coffee from Scott's old game Desolate Hope occasionally shows up on the desk. Coffee is a sentient coffee machine with arms and legs that also appeared in FNAF World. Number 70. In Help Wanted's Funtime Foxy Dark Room minigame, you'll be jump scared by Lolbit if you step on the red tiling out of bounds. This is the first time Lolbit actually has a jump scare in FNAF. In Sister Location and Ultimate Custom Night, Lolbit served as more of a distraction, making you type LOL to get rid of it. Number 71. Lolbit gets a much more prominent role and finally a time to shine in the blacklight level of Darkroom Funtime Foxy, as this time around, Lolbit's the primary threat, replacing Funtime Foxy himself. Number 72. The parts and services room in FNAF VR Help Wanted, where you repair the original four animatronics with instructions from Hand Unit, bears a striking resemblance to the parts and services room of FNAF 2, and is probably meant to be the same location. Number 73. Vent repair is probably the most unique of any of the vanilla Help Wanted modes. It doesn't really draw from any previous games. See, Dark Rooms is based on the FNAF 4 plush trap minigame in Sister Location, while Parts and Maintenance is inspired by Pizzeria Simulator Salvaging, and Night Terrors is similar to FNAF 4. FNAF 1 through 3 levels are obvious throwbacks to FNAF 1 through 3. Number 74. In Vent Repair and Help Wanted, Mangle isn't always the only animatronic lurking about his level. If the player looks down, they might find a mysterious endoskeleton lurking beneath them, clutching the grate. Number 75. Ennard's not alone in his Vent Repair level either, as you can sometimes catch a cameo by Bon Bon in the elevator shaft of Ennard's stage. For those who don't remember, Bon Bon is the Bonnie Hand puppet from Back in Sister Location. Number 76. Of course, the Blacklight levels feature even more Vent Repair antagonists. Mangle now has a doppelganger, and Springtrap joins Ennard in hunting you down. Number 77. Bonnet's mechanic changes between FNAF 4 
for Night Terrors. In Night Terrors, she appears by popping out of the dresser, bringing a new threat within the room itself, kinda akin to the Frettles in the original FNAF 4. For those who don't remember, Bonnet is basically a pink bod bon. Number 78. The Circus Baby Night Terrors level is somewhat unique, with the player having to hide from Circus Baby in a closet. It does bring back memories and similar door closing tension from Biddy Bab's level in Sister Location. Number 79. The Blacklight level of Night Terrors Pizza Party is the most free roaming area within the game. You must traverse a maze made up of various FNAF locations that's chock full of killer animatronics to find your pizza party, but fans know something far more sinister than pizza is waiting for you. Number 80. The name Night Terrors is a play on words, referring to the fact that FNAF 4 is widely thought to take place within the comatose nightmares of a certain 80s bite victim. Number 81. You can get L chips, tortilla chips, and L chips, tortilla chips, bold and spicy if you unlock them at the prize counter. It's a bit odd considering L chip is a major business rival of Freddy Fazbear Entertainment. You know, I find it just a bit unrealistic that they would carry their products. I can only suspend my disbelief so much, Scott. Number 82. Outside of the Halloween DLC, the prize counter can offer one of three bobbleheads, five toys, 18 food or drink items, 18 action figures, or 12 plushies. Or, you know, a plush trap jump scare. Number 83. Players can also unlock special items once a certain number of Faz tokens are collected. These coveted prizes include a rolled paper, plastic cup, and a cockroach. Number 84. There are a total of 16 tapes found throughout FNAF VR Help Wanted, but they're hidden like Faz tokens. Well, to be fair, they're not hidden quite as well as Faz tokens. You know, they're pretty much either in plain view or not well hidden at all. Most of the game's lore is revealed in these tapes. Number 85. The tape player used to listen to these 16 tapes is called the Tony Runner. This is a clear knockoff of the infamous Sony Walkman from 1979, because the FNAF audience will totally get that joke. Number 86. The tape room is usually dark and desolate, but on extremely rare occasions, Glitch Trap will show up to taunt and haunt you further. Number 87. The Halloween DLC, Curse of Dreadbear, released in parts over October 23rd, October 29th, and October 31st, 2019. They introduced two new animatronics, Dreadbear and Grim Foxy. Number 88. Dreadbear, the titular DLC character, is yet another Freddy Fazbear iteration. He is essentially a Frankenstein Freddy, complete with a thick brow, lumbering physique, stitching, and neck screws. Though, I doubt he's afraid of fire, unfortunately. Number 89. Sorry, sorry, he's essentially a Frankenstein's monster Freddy. In a way, you play as Dr. Frankenstein in the spooky mansion Dreadbear minigame. You're following instructions given by hand unit to bring the monster to life, just like the doctor from Mary Shelley's gothic masterpiece. Number 90. Dreadbear is the largest FNAF animatronic to date. Quite the feat considering how monstrous these huge hulking metal machines have been. Number 91. According to the game's initial title, Dreadbear's original name was Frank and Freddy, which, frankly, I like better. Number 92. Dreadbear could be considered the 10th iteration of Freddy Fazbear in the FNAF franchise. The others being Original Freddy, Withered Freddy, Shadow Freddy, Toy Freddy, Funtime Freddy, Rockstar Freddy, Molten Freddy, Phantom Freddy, and Nightmare Freddy. And I'm not even mentioning the iterations of Golden Freddy and Fredbear. Number 93. Grim Foxy is basically Jacko Foxy, joining the ranks of Jacko Bunny and Jacko Chica from the FNAF 4 Halloween DLC. Now we have the Jacko Trifecta. Freddy needs a Jacko iteration to complete the Fab Four. Number 94. The tune that Grim Foxy occasionally sings within his corn maze level in Curse of Dreadbear is a version of the song Foxy hums way back in FNAF 1 in Pirate's Cove. Number 95. The Pirate Ride minigame in the Afraid of the Dark section of Curse of Dreadbear is very similar to real amusement park shooter rides like Disney's Buzz Lightyear's Space Ranger Spin. Number 96. If you score more than 9,999 points in Pirate Ride, the score will be reset to zero. It's like the Y2K of video games. Number 97. BB, in the Trick or Treat section of Spooky Mansion, magically turns into Nightmare BB during his jump scare. This is because Vanilla Balloon Boy never actually jump scared throughout the series. Number 98. The main menu of Curse of Dreadbear features a few Easter eggs, like a dancing glitch trap back near the house on the hill, which looks like the FNAF 4 house by the way, and a pirate ship on the lake, presumably belonging to Foxy. Number 99. The prize room, or barn, within the DLC has a handful of darts and randomized posters. If the player somehow spawns three clown posters, which is very rare, and hits all three with a dart, their room will suddenly turn dark and the Game 1 sign will change to It's me. Number 100. The Halloween DLC also added 39 new prizes to achieve, 40 if you include the rabbit mask that you can get for finding the secret exit in the corn maze. Number 101. Picking up the glitch trap plush while wearing this rabbit mask will trigger a message from the reluctant follower. Yes, I hear you. I know. No. There's no miscommunication. I understand. Yes, I have it. I made it myself. I think you would like it. No. No one suspects anything. Don't worry. I'll be ready and I won't let you down. It will be fun. Fans are still debating exactly what this means and who the follower might be. Number 102. The long-anticipated FNAF movie is finally starting to come to fruition. It is being produced by Blumhouse Productions, a powerhouse in the horror movie world who in the last couple decades have made a hit after hit, like the Paranormal Activity series, the Insidious franchise, the Purge series, Get Out, Happy Death Day, and so, so, so much more. Things were all ready to go with director Chris Columbus on board, but Scott vetoed the initial script in November 2018. Number 103. Fortunately, production seems to still be moving forward, as the film is rumored to be released in 2020 
2020 or 2021. We fans would much rather wait for a quality product than be disappointed by something rushed out. Number 104. Scott has emphasized that the FNAF movie and any subsequent sequels will only be based on the first three games in the franchise. Probably a good call, considering how convoluted the plot and lore became after those titles. Number 105. It's rumored that Scream Queen Jamie Lee Curtis, who was a huge fan of FNAF, will likely appear in the upcoming movie. Who's scarier, Michael Myers or Balloon Boy? Number 106. The Banana Splits movie seems to have beat FNAF to the punch, being released in August of 2019. This horror film about animatronics based on Hanna-Barbera's retro Banana Splits, making a murderous turn after learning of their show's cancellation, has been rightfully called out for its similarities to a certain video game series. Number 107. Additionally, there's a movie in the works called Lolly's Wonderland, about a janitor fighting off a barrage of attacks from animatronics in an old amusement park. I know, this sounds like an even bigger ripoff of FNAF, but it stars Nicolas Cage. FNAF. With Nicolas Cage. Just take my money. When Sister Location hit the scene, it caused some waves. It added in the fun time animatronics, let you control Michael Afton, and generally scared the crap out of anyone playing. Of course, we here at the leaderboard had to catch folks up to speed ASAP. And thus, seven FNAF Sister Location facts you should know was born. With the fourth Five Nights at Freddy's game being subtitled The Final Chapter, many members of the Freddy fanbase truly thought that that was the end of one of the most unexpectedly successful game franchises of all time. That is, until series creator Scott Cawthon realized that there were still many underpants left to ruin, more videos of Markiplier screaming to be laughed at, and more Steam sales to be had. Oh, the Steam sales. Completely out of the blue, old Scotty returned with the latest offering in the series. Hi, I'm Jacob with the Leaderboard, and today we're going to uncover cover seven quick facts about Five Nights at Freddy's sister location. From the game's humble beginnings and development, to the days leading up to its release, to some of the game's deepest, darkest narrative secrets. Get that extra pair of pants ready and sit back with your most exotic set of butters because we're about to dive into the fifth game at Freddy's. pre-release hoaxes. Developer Scott Cawthon tried to keep most of the voices for the game a secret before the release of Sister Location, but, as we all know, it's impossible to keep anything a secret in the age of the internet. In August of 2016, audio clips that weren't intended to be heard by the public were leaked, and because it's Five Nights at Freddy's, they went viral. And Scott was not the type of person to just brush it off and let these leaks go unpunished. Some longtime fans of Five Nights at Freddy's see Scott Cawthon as something of a sadistic troll whose thirst can only be quenched by the tears of his legions of fans, the man having trolled his fans time and time again over the course of the first four games in the series. Upon learning that somebody had leaked the voice clips, he broke out his keyboard and retaliated by stirring up some chaos among his tremendous fandom. Scott uploaded a teaser image of the latest game to his website that came across as something more akin to an unsettling announcement with the capacity to break the world. The image contained the harrowing text, cancelled due to leaks. The fans that weren't crying over this announcement quickly discovered that, upon simply brightening up the image, that this text was part of a newspaper article that added to the game's lore, claiming that the grand opening of Circus Baby's Pizza World was cancelled due to gas leaks. <laughs> oh, you're so clever with your wordplay, Scott, you jerk. You'd think that after teasing the cancellation of a highly anticipated game, enough was enough, but Scott needed more tears to fill that fancy solid gold in-ground swimming pool he just installed using his sweet Steam sale cash. Three days before the game's release date, on October 7th of 2016, Scott made a public announcement on Steam claiming that the game's storyline had become darker and scarier than he had anticipated and decided he had to think of the children and make it lighter and more accessible for all fans. In order to do this, he had to delay several more months before the public could experience the latest installment. Surely enough, Scott was revealed to be a big fat liar yet again when the game appeared on the Steam page just as planned. Luckily for Scott, the fans were too busy playing the game to be angry with him. That genius. That evil genius. Funtime Freddy's Blueprints Despite the leak, there were still many secrets that thankfully went unspoiled. While you are able to view blueprints for the animatronics in the game itself, blueprints released outside of the game go into a bit more detail. Perhaps more detail than we would have liked and now regret knowing. If you look at the blueprints for Funtime Freddy, you'll see that he's designated as a storage tank. What could they possibly mean by this? You'll be sorry you asked. Upon closer inspection, you'll find that among Freddy's mechanical innards are a few shapes that clearly aren't machinery. You can make out what looks to be a pair of shoes, arms, a torso, and of course, a head all curled up into something of a fetal position. Put simply, it appears as though Freddy has got a child in his belly, and we don't think the kid got stuck in there playing a game of hide and seek. There are quite a few theories about this. 
none of which are pleasant. One theory takes into account Freddy's ability to mimic voices, claiming that Freddy was built as the perfect kidnapping machine, luring children away from safety using a familiar voice, only to snatch them when the time is right. But for what purpose? first animatronic voice acting. Five Nights at Freddy's was scary enough as it is, with its Chuck E. Cheese animatronics from the deepest, darkest pits of heck. But Scott found a way to make them even scarier for the fifth installment. <laughs> for the first time in the main series, no clever commenters, this does not include Five Nights at Freddy's world, Five Nights at Freddy's brought the characters to life by enlisting the help of various voice actors. The game got not one, not 16, but 17 different voice actors to haunt our nightmares for years to Come. It may be hard to believe given their stellar performances, but Sister Location was actually the first professional gig for some of these actors. But there were also many seasoned voice actors as well. The man who finally gave Freddy a voice, Kellen Goff, has dabbled in quite a bit of voice acting starting at a young age, and he's appeared in many projects, including roles in Hearthstone Heroes of Warcraft, Family Guy The Quest for Stuff, and another Markiplier favorite, Yandere Simulator. You've also got Heather Masters, who played Baby once before in the spin-off game Five Nights at Freddy's World, and landed the role of Spider-Gwen in the game Marvel Avengers Academy. She's also set to return to the horror gaming scene, playing the role of Cassandra Noble in the upcoming release, Faceless. The Other Freddy. As you Sister Location vets out there know, the Funtime Auditorium section is pitch black. To successfully traverse it, you've got to use the flash on a camera, but you can only use the flash on Funtime Foxy a few times before it jump scares you, ending the game. What you may not know is that there are actually two animatronics in the room. If you flash your light at just the right moment, you may catch a glimpse of what looks to be an endoskeleton just sitting there, deactivated, staring into your soul. While many may initially think this unsettling easter egg is some incomplete version of Funtime Freddy, closer observations reveal that this is, in fact, a new animatronic to haunt our nightmares because we didn't have enough of those already. The first and most obvious difference you'll notice is that this guy still has both hands, neither of them being replaced by a bonbon puppet. Eagle-eyed players will catch a few more subtle differences, like a lack of face frames and the fact that the irises in his eyes are yellow instead of blue. This character has been given the name Yendo, a combination of the words yellow, his iris color, and endoskeleton. If you can't quite find him in the base game, don't fret, he'll show up to scare the living hell out of you in the game's non-canonical custom night. Circus Baby's not-so-secret origin. After four games, I think it's safe to say Freddy has held the spotlight for long enough. Let's shift gears and hand the mic over to Sister Location's feature attraction, Circus Baby. During the game, we get an idea of Baby's origin story through a first-person account that can be described as unsettling, tragic, and dare we say it, maybe even a little adorable all at the same time? However, it is possible to see how the story unfolded, or rather play it, thanks to a secret minigame hidden within Sister Location starring the half-clown, half-girl herself, because as we all know, clowns are not human. To access it, you've got one of two options. Either die a bunch and pray to our lord and savior, Scott Cawthon, that you will ascend to it, or take the easy way by going into the extras menu and clicking the 8-bit baby sprite in the bottom left-hand corner. The minigame functions similarly to the death minigames found in Five Nights at Freddy's 2. You play as an 8-bit baby that is tasked with feeding cupcakes to a swarm of happy children, Super Mario Brothers style. The catch is that you have but a minute to feed all of the children in order to achieve the minigame's secret ending that definitely shatters the minigame's warm and bubbly tone. If you grab an ice cream cone and carry it to the start of the level, you'll find an absolutely adorable 8-bit girl who goes to grab the ice cream, only to be met with an untimely death. <laughs> More specifically, a metal arm comes out of Baby's body and kills the girl. And that girl in question is none other than, wait for it, the daughter of William Afton, co-owner of Fazbear Entertainment, creator of animatronic hell monsters, and serial killer extraordinaire. I guess Karma finally caught up with him through his daughter, which doesn't seem very fair to his daughter. Chamber of Secrets. By completing this mini game, you're rewarded with a key card that unlocks something so big, it just leaves us with even more questions to be answered because this franchise didn't have enough of those already. I think closure is a foreign concept to Scott, but then again, we know how much he craves our suffering. On night five, ignore baby when she tells you to go left and forward and instead go right and forward where you'll find a door that will unlock thanks to that key card you got. Upon entering, you'll be smacked in the face with 
with a load of sweet, sweet nostalgia of the past three years. The room looks almost identical to the office rooms from previous installments in the Five Nights at Freddy's saga, but there's more to this room than meets the eye. One of the first things you'll notice is a keypad, which isn't merely set decor. Punch in the code 1983 and the three TV monitors will display live footage of the rooms from Five Nights at Freddy's 4, which leads us to believe that the player character in said game was being watched the entire time, but by who? It's likely William Afton, but like many mysteries in the series, it's not 100% confirmed. Sister locations, hidden locations. The secret room isn't the only connection made to the series' fourth installment. During night two, you're tasked with restoring power to the facility from the breaker room, made even more complicated by the fact that you're also being hunted by Funtime Freddy. You'll encounter a map of the facility within the room, but you may be too stressed out to notice a few key details. Luckily for you, fans have taken the time to decode a few secrets that we can now share without you having to worry about a big old Fredbear jump scare. <laughs> Oh, whoops, sorry. The white-lined areas represent the Circus Baby's entertainment and rental, but there are three grayed-out areas on the map that represent three areas from Five Nights at Freddy's 4. The one on the top left corner perfectly fits the layout of the map of the mini-games found in the fourth game, which starts from the house to the pizzeria down the street. On the bottom left, you'll find a diagram that resembles a strip surrounded by four small boxes, which is an allusion to fun time with plush trap. Last but not least, the formation of shapes on the top right closely resembles the layout of the bedroom found in Five Nights at Freddy's 4. If if you take an even closer look at this map, you may see gray and white dots planted randomly on the map. Only their placement is anything but random, because of course they aren't. The gray ones represent the location of the animatronics, while the white ones represent the location of the player. Taking the dots into account with the FNAF 4 locations, you'll soon realize that the gray dots are placed in the exact spots where the animatronics appear in that game. What does all of this mean exactly? Some fans have connected this easter egg with the later easter egg found in the secret room, which features monitors that keep tabs on rooms from Five Nights at Freddy's 4. This has led many theorists to believe that Five Nights at Freddy's 4's environment was a training facility concocted by William Afton to test his deadly toy's child-murdering skills, which William Afton could observe and document, but again, it's just a theory. Hey, we said not every question would be answered. Be thankful you get any kind of closure at all in this game, like being able to watch the final episode of The Immortal and the Restless. Count your blessings, champ. Speaking of adding in animatronics, how many of these mechanical monstrosities are there? Each iteration adds new variations to the classics, as well as brand new creatures to jump scare you right out of your gaming chair. To help you keep all of these animatronics straight, we developed a video explaining each and every one of them. It's every animatronic in Five Nights at Freddy's, and it's starting right now. With about 10 main games in the series, Five Nights at Freddy's has tons of animatronics. So now it's time to go through each and every one of them. We'll highlight any animatronic that has sentience or can directly threaten the player in some way. Oh, and I'm leaving out FNAF World. I'd apologize, but I don't feel bad. But I will include withered and scrapped versions of the same animatronics as separate entries. I'm Marcus with the leaderboard, and this is every FNAF animatronic ever. Freddy Fazbear. Freddy is the lead singer of the original FNAF foursome, and the mascot of Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. In FNAF 1, Freddy often waits for a security guard to run out of power before he strikes. However, in later nights, Freddy becomes more and more active whenever the camera isn't watching his movements. Like all classic animatronics, he murders his victims by stuffing their body into a quote-unquote empty animatronic suit. Bonnie the Rabbit, the rocking lead guitarist of Freddy's band, makes good use of his speedy bunny persona. He actively jumps from room to room around the pizzeria to distract the night guard. The left side of the pizzeria and office is his domain, and he's the most frequent visitor to the office. Don't worry though, Bonnie's also the most skittish and easy to scare off with a door slam to the face. Chica the Chicken gives backup vocals to Freddy's power belting. She also wanders the whole pizzeria like Bonnie, but attacks the night guard from the right side. Outside of her bloodlust, she's mostly known for her cupcake sidekick and her gluttonous appetite for pizza. Foxy the fox is a pirate missing some teeth, an eye, well, allegedly, and his tail. As the always essential accordion player of the band, Foxy clearly had a sheltered upbringing and is pretty shy. He only attacks the night guard by spontaneously bursting from his pirate cove and sprinting straight to the office. Golden Freddy. Golden Freddy is a total mystery. Nothing stops him, not doors, lights, or being monitored on the camera. In fact, he acts as more of a ghostly easter egg in the original FNAF, dooming anyone unfortunate enough to stumble upon his rare poster. Hiding in the monitor can sometimes save the night guard from his wrath, well, 
in the first game at least. Endo-01 is an animatronic endoskeleton missing the rest of its anthropomorphic suit. It's unclear which, if any, classic animatronic it's supposed to be when fully assembled. Still, even though it's not finished, Endo-01 occasionally turns and stares into the backstage surveillance camera in FNAF 1, proving its sentience. The puppet. This possessed marionette from FNAF 2 is one needy dead child. To prevent a grisly death, the night guard must constantly keep the puppet's home, a music box, wound up to keep the puppet at bay. If that wasn't annoying enough, the night guard can blame the puppet for all of his problems, as it's the one that gave life to the classic animatronics. Toy Freddy the head of the toy brand of animatronics, hardcore gamer Toy Freddy was designed to be even more friendly and huggable to children. Don't get confused though, this thing is actually a security measure. See, Toy Freddy isn't possessed, but it's programmed to attack any shady characters that seem out of place in the pizzeria, like the night guard. Just like Toy Freddy, Toy Bonnie is designed to kinda look like an action figure while beefing up security. Like Toy Freddy, Toy Bonnie is also fooled by a simple Freddy mask slash head disguise, and won't attack anyone who's wearing one thinking that they're an animatronic. Unlike Toy Freddy, who attacks from the hall, Bonnie prefers the claustrophobic vents. The most iconic part of Toy Chica is what's missing, her beak. Without it, she looks far more terrifying as she closes in on the night guard through the vents. She's more into partying than eating you can tell by her new bib. This fun, party girl persona kinda matches her animeization in Ultimate Custom Night. Mangle. Wondering where Toy Foxy is? Well, you're looking at him. Or her. It's really, really not clear. But Mangle is a partially deconstructed animatronic, possibly ripped apart by child patrons. It looks far more ravaged than its toy counterparts, but at least Mangle's jaw is still intact, and with Mangle hanging down from the ceiling, it can directly target a security guard's frontal lobe. Balloon Boy, or BB, or Boy, is thankfully a pacifist in his debut. Even so, security guards hate him more than most animatronics because he's just so annoying. He loves playing hilarious pranks by disabling flashlights and vent lights, all while gleefully laughing in the night guard's ears. He can thankfully be fooled by a Freddy mask as well. JJ, also known as Balloon Girl, JJ is even more peaceful than Balloon Boy in FNAF 2. She just peers her eyes over the desk on rare evenings in FNAF 2 as somewhat of an easter egg. JJ got bolder in Ultimate Custom Night though, as she can disable security guard's door controls. Withered Freddy After the Freddy Fazbear pizza murders, the classic line of FNAF animatronics were decommissioned and left to rot, but they still had those pesky child souls within them. As such, Withered Freddy often wanders away from parts and services to sneak up on the night guard in FNAF 2. He and his cohorts are later restored in time for FNAF 1, which takes place after FNAF 2. It's a whole mess, so go check out our FNAF timeline if you want to know more. Withered Bonnie Arguably the most withered of the original animatronics, poor Bonnie is missing an arm and a face. That's because he was used to refurbish and retrofit other animatronics. But that doesn't stop Withered Bonnie from being even more aggressive than Withered Freddy throughout FNAF 2. With extra sunken eyes and ripped off hands, Withered Chica looks and acts way more ravenous than her normal form. It's probably because with no hands, she can't hold her cupcake. Oh, it's cruel. Like other withered counterparts, she's fooled by the fake Freddy Fazbear head, but she's still a threat when she begins wandering out from parts and services. Like Withered Freddy, Withered Foxy is in relatively decent shape for a decommissioned hunk of metal. But don't think that Freddy Fazbear head will save you this time. This Foxy won't fall for it. Instead, just scare Withered Foxy off with a flashlight. Just goes to show you how reclusive and skittish he truly is. Shadow Freddy this mysterious entity shows up on occasion in parts and services and can crash the night guard's game, I mean, uh, crash the night guard's brain. He doesn't even need a jump scare to enter the office to bring everything crashing down. There's still so much mystery surrounding this character, and lots of fans debate about whether this Shadow Freddy is actually the same entity as FNAF 4's Nightmare. RWQFSFASXC, aka RXQ, aka Shadow Bonnie, is another mysterious shadow entity that occasionally shows up throughout the revamped Freddy Fazbear's Pizza in 1987. He can randomly appear right in the office, and like with Shadow Freddy, staring at RXQ too long causes a crashed game. Endo-02 Just like Endo-01, very little is known about this unidentifiable harmless endoskeleton. However, this model is far more active as it occasionally wanders around the pizzeria. Springtrap What do you get when you mix a psychotic child murderer and a rudimentary dangerous springtrap suit? A menace. 
Spring Bonnie, the original Bonnie from Fred Bear's Family Diner, locked down and crushed William Afton to death as he fled from his ghostly child victims. Unfortunately, this just made him a nearly immortal, unstoppable force, targeting visitors of Fazbear's Fright decades later. He's the only entity in Fazbear's Fright that can actually harm, <coughs> murder, the guard. Phantom Freddy The first of the harmless hallucinations popping up throughout Fazbear's Fright, Phantom Freddy seems to be the ghost of Golden Freddy, rather than the original. Phantom Freddy can shut down a guard's precious ventilation system. He doesn't attack hard, busy workers, though. Keeping focused on the monitors can prevent a Phantom Freddy attack. Phantom Balloon Boy He's more devious than his normal toy counterpart, yet still physically completely harmless. And yet, Phantom is somehow even more annoying. He constantly shows up to block the night guard's view. His jump scare is easy to avoid though, just change cameras before lowering the monitor whenever he shows up. But if he does get to you, you'll lose ventilation control. Chica's Phantom version is most distinguished by her extremely creepy, piercing white eyes. She matches Balloon Boy's distracting behavior, though only shows up on Cam 7. Like all Phantom animatronics, Phantom Chica looks as though she's been horribly burned, perhaps foreshadowing something. Phantom Foxy doesn't jump around as a hallucination all over Fazbear's Fright. He instead only shows up right in the office near a box of spare parts. He's probably looking for his now missing right arm and iconic hook. Although Phantom Foxy's only an apparition, he can also scare the guard into losing control of their ventilation system. Phantom Mangle is another hallucination in Fazbear's Fright, but they only appear on Cam 4. You often see them hanging from the ceiling, like old school Mangle. When Mangle's in the office, instead of a jump scare, the night guard is treated to an extremely obnoxious whining noise that makes it impossible to hear the actually dangerous spring trap. Phantom Puppet, like Mangle, also lacks a jump scare. Instead, they just show up in the office and obscure the night guard's view and control for 17 seconds. You'll only see Phantom Puppet on Cam 3 around Fazbear's Fright, and thankfully this time, they aren't constantly pining for attention with a music box. Nightmare Freddy the first of the Nightmare animatronics, which may or may not all be in the mind of a wounded child's head, Nightmare Freddy is most known for the miniature freddles that help make up his body. These tiny, demonic teddy bears gather together, and if a certain dreaming child doesn't ward them off with a flashlight blast, Nightmare Freddy will fully assemble and attack. Like Nightmare Freddy and all other colleagues, Nightmare Bonnie is the bunny we know and love, but with grotesque claws, teeth, eyes, and more. Nightmare Bonnie stalks the left side of the child's home, only attacking from the left bedroom door. You can ward him off with a flashlight beam down the hall, and you can tell he's right outside the door if you hear his loud breathing. So, who stalks the right side of the house and bedroom? You already know it's Nightmare Chica. She has similar mechanics to Bonnie with the breathing and hatred of flashlights. What really makes this Chica stand out is her new sentient Nightmare Cupcake. This cupcake can even attack itself. Wait, I guess that means Nightmare Cupcake. It's a cupcake with razor sharp teeth. They're happy. Nightmare Foxy can use both halls, and is in many ways a throwback to his original mechanics. You can hear him sprinting towards the room from either direction, and if he successfully enters the room, camps out in the closet a la Pirate's Cove. The child must then hold the closet door shut to keep Nightmare Foxy at bay. Nightmare Fredbear is actually the first physical iteration of Fredbear in the series. Fredbear being the original Freddy Fazbear mascot, complete with golden springlock suit. If the child can survive several nights of monsters, they'll come face to face with Nightmare Fredbear. Nightmare Fredbear can attack from both halls, the closet, and the bed, so he's the ultimate challenge. Nightmare. Okay, I lied. Once you hit Night 7, Nightmare is the ultimate, ultimate challenge of FNAF 4. This extra-shadowed, corrupted version of Nightmare Fredbear is far more aggressive. I mean, Nightmare is the Nightmare version of Nightmare Fredbear, which itself is the Nightmare version of Fredbear, which is also a nightmare. Plush Trap. The Nightmare, and arguably toy version of the Spring Bonnie Willie Afton hybrid, prefers playing games to straight up assault. Don't be fooled, it's tiny, but this creature packs all the evil of his counterpart. Plush Trap slowly creeps towards the child in darkness, but if the child can time a flashlight shine perfectly when the monster is on an X, his attack will be thwarted. Nightmare Balloon Boy acts exactly the same as Plush Trap in FNAF 4, with his nearly identical minigame, Fun with Balloon Boy. The only real difference is BB is even faster. This is the first time an iteration of Balloon Boy can actually attack and kill. His double razor teeth are spooky and all, but those gangly hands are what keep me up at night. Jacko Bonnie is what happens if you jack o lanternize a demonic nightmare killer animatronic rabbit. This special Halloween DLC version of Nightmare Bonnie glows in the dark and is honestly super pretty. He acts pretty much identically to his non-glowy counterpart from the regular game. 
Can't have a lantern bunny without a lantern chicken, obviously. She acts just like Nightmare Chica in the main game, but the cupcake has been completely replaced. Instead, Jacko Chica carries around a killer sentient jack-o'-lantern, because theming. Look, if you really want to count that jack-o'-lantern as a separate animatronic, be my guest. Nightmare Mangle. No Jacko Foxy, but Nightmare Mangle works just as well for now. Again, the mechanics are nearly identical to its main game counterpart, but now Mangle's signature audio distorted feedback joins in to distract the poor child from important audio cues. Rounding off the Halloween DLC animatronics is Nightmare On, basically a nightmare puppet with the same behavior as the main game's Nightmare. This gangly bastard is the most terrifying animatronic yet, especially when its creepy music box theme begins to play as it stalks around the house. Circus Baby is a delightful clown animatronic and mascot of Circus Baby's Entertainment, a spin-off of Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. Too bad Willie Afton foolishly designed Baby to appeal to children and violently maimed them. His own daughter, Elizabeth Afton, was murdered and assimilated into Circus Baby. Years later, she both guided and betrayed Michael Afton as he explored the derelict sister location. Ballora is the tall leggy ballerina animatronic that Michael Afton is forced to harass with controlled shocks. When she tries to murder him on the way to the breaker room, Michael is able to quietly sneak around her, pay attention to her music to know when she's near and when it's safe to move. Mini arenas are like if the puppet and Ballora spawned a bunch of spider-like offspring. They harass Michael as he winds the locks within a dangerous spring lock suit, but can be warded off with a good shake. Funtime Foxy, who should really be more like Funtime Mangle, is another circus animatronic stalking Michael in the sister location. He operates in darkness, and Michael must use a flash beacon, stealth, and a bit of luck to sneak past the sly fox. Lolbit is a bit of a troll character reskin of Funtime Foxy, and I swear, it's the most annoying idea Scott Cawthon has had since Balloon Boy. Lolbit blocks the view of all monitors with its lovely mug, and can only be warded off by typing LOL. Freddy takes the backseat this time around, but he's just as deadly. Funtime Freddy stalks Michael, as Michael's nose is buried in a monitor trying to painfully, slowly restore power within the sister location. Fortunately, you can trick Funtime Freddy with a cheesy voice clip audio distraction. Yendo appears to be a Funtime Freddy endoskeleton that occasionally shows up to distract Michael while he tries to escape Funtime Foxy. In the custom night, he acts supernatural, showing up in the office at random. Bon Bon is a Bonnie hand puppet that Funtime Freddy wears, but when Michael Afton has to repair him, one false move will send this Jim Henson reject on the attack. Bonnet is the pink version of Bon Bon that, sadly, doesn't have a hand to puppet him. He still tries to kill Michael during Sister Location's custom night, but you can stop it with an adorable bop on the nose. Biddy Bab is a baby animatronic, and I don't really get the circus theming here, but I'm still extremely terrified. Michael has to hide under a desk from Biddy Bab desperately holding a door to avoid the worst case of teething imaginable. Electrobab. It's an electric-themed bitty bab. What do you expect? Though strangely, they can be deterred with a controlled electric shock in the custom night. Ennard is a grotesque combination of Baby, Funtime Foxy, Funtime Freddy, and Bon Bon. This metallic Frankenstein ultimately scoops Michael and steals his fleshy exoskeleton to escape into the real world, flawlessly blending into society without raising any suspicions whatsoever. Hey, you guys, you guys smell something? Lefty was mysteriously designed by Cassette Man as a way to trap the puppet. This was all part of an elaborate scheme to lure all possessed animatronics into one trap location. Like the other salvageable animatronics, Lefty is attracted to, but can also be distracted by, sound. Scrap Baby. At some point after the events of Sister Location, it looks like Baby had a falling out with the rest of Ennard. She must have gotten too bossy or something, because Ennard rejected this violence-hungry clown, creating the even more sadistic Scrap Baby. Molten Freddy. So, what happened to the rest of Ennard? Well, meet Molten Freddy. He's the final animatronic along with William Afton and Scrap Baby that Cassette Man lures to Pizza Palace to finally put to rest. Scrap Trap. FNAF 3 was all about burning William, aka Scrap Trap, to oblivion, but apparently it didn't work. I mean, this sucker barely looks singed. Thankfully, Pizzeria Simulator finishes him off for good. Well, sorta. Candy Cadet. Okay, so Candy Cadet isn't sentient or hostile, but you know I had to at least mention this lovable, candy-obsessed storyteller. Rockstar Freddy heads the Rockstar version of the original foursome. They debuted in Pizzeria Simulator, but were completely harmless until you meet them in Hell for Ultimate Custom Night. Rockstar Freddy is basically Toy Freddy with a star on his chest. He demands payment throughout Ultimate Custom Night, but can be tricked with a heater, but that lures other foes. 
Frank Sinatra wannabe Rockstar Bonnie is extremely forgetful. In Ultimate Custom Night, he thinks Afton stole his misplaced guitar. Afton, aka you as the player, has to frantically search throughout the facility to locate it before Rockstar Bonnie strikes in vengeance. Rockstar Chica is another Rockstar animatronic with a unique mechanic for Ultimate Custom Night. Deathly afraid of slipping and breaking her maracas, she can be thwarted simply by placing a wet floor sign in her path. Rockstar Foxy can actually help Afton in Ultimate Custom Night. Well, actually, his animatronic parrot can help Afton. If you click this parrot as it flies across the office, it can grant a bonus. Though, sometimes it just grants a Rockstar Foxy jump scare. And since they're so tied together, I'm not counting the parrot as a different character. Happy Frog is first of the embarrassing poor man's animatronics known as Mediocre Melodies, who were also harmless in Pizzeria Simulator. In Ultimate Custom Night, she talks and acts like a little kid seeing as you can easily fool her with audio cues. But her cold-blooded nature makes her immune to heat. On the flip side, you have Orville Elephant, the smartest of the mediocre melodies. So he is rarely fooled by audio cues. He's a thespian with a failed career, kinda like me. So he does the next best thing with his time and tortures William Afton in hell, Mr. Hippo. Boy, oh boy, can this guy spin a yarn. Mr. Hippo's rambling, babbling stories tend to last several minutes. I'm really not sure what's more painful, his post-mortem monologues or him actually killing you. I'd argue that Pigpatch is the most mediocre of the melodies. He loves war philosophers like Sun Tzu, but that doesn't make him smart or tactical. He always falls for audio cues and is warded off by the heater in Ultimate Custom Night. Then we have the biggest ripoff of the mediocre melodies, Ned Bear. It's clearly <clears throat> inspired by the most iconic mascot of the series, you know, Bonnie. At least he stands out with his corny one-liners when slaughtering Afton. El Chip is the beaver mascot of El Chip's Fiesta Buffet, who shares a striking resemblance to another one of Scott Cawthon's creations. Hmm. Anyway, he doesn't directly affect Afton in Ultimate Custom Night, but his marketing does. His obnoxious commercials interrupt repeatedly, night after night. That's truly hell. Oddly enough, Funtime Chica is the only Funtime animatronic missing from Sister Location. She's for sale in Pizzeria Simulator, then finally distracts William Afton in hell with her vanity and obnoxious camera flashes. Helpy is a helpful guide in Pizzeria Simulator, but his air horn turns into a distracting nuisance for William Afton in hell. He's kinda like a squat, more adorable version of Funtime Freddy. Music Man. This dude's just looking for a jam sesh. In Ultimate Custom Night, Music Man is attracted to noise, so he plays the cymbals, building and building in righteous musical intensity until he jump scares in excitement. Mr. Hugs slash Trash in the gang. So the only member of Trash in the gang we really need to talk about is Mr. Hugs. As a sentient vacuum cleaner in Ultimate Custom Night, he's the only one of these cheap bundles of crap that could technically be considered an animatronic. We'll lump him in with his cohorts Mr. Can Do, Bucket Bob, Pants Dan, and Number One Crate. Dee Dee. The third and most obnoxious balloon, Triplet, the singing Dee Dee can summon unique animatronics and raise the power of existing ones in Ultimate Custom Night. As if she couldn't get any worse, her character technically debuted in FNAF World, but I already said I'm not going there. XOR, or Shadow Dee Dee, is the 50-20 grayscale version of Dee Dee. It seems like she's kind of glitched out, and she'll summon all of her characters at once. Old Man Consequences isn't really an animatronic by definition, but he's enough of a threat to mention. He came from FNAF World to torment Afton, showing up throughout Ultimate Custom Night and forcing him to beat a timing minigame. His peaceful pawn can be explored and drowned in through an easter egg. Phone Guy, the initial guide of the series, Phone Guy's familiar voice has shakily warned us how to survive since the very beginning, but by Ultimate Custom Night, his calls just drag on and on, causing far too much unnecessary noise. Fredbear is the original mascot of the original Fred Bear animatronic themed restaurant from decades ago. But Fredbear didn't actually show up outside of an 8-bit minigame form until Ultimate Custom Night. Even then, he's an easter egg activated by using a death coin on Golden Freddy when he's set at level 1. Dude totally caused the bite of 83 though. Glitch Trap Endless torture in hell could only keep Willie Afton down for so long. He soon found himself manifested as a digital bunny corrupting the world of the Freddy Fazbear virtual experience. His ultimate goal is to steal the body of playtesters, unleashing himself into the real world and spreading like the computer virus that he is. Plush Baby The plush version of Baby, obviously. These stuffed menaces harass the playtester in dark light levels by popping up at random throughout a room. Failure to flash a light and scare off each one will result in some kind of grisly death. I can't 
really imagine what a plush doll would be capable of, though. The Frankensteinian Dreadbear is like seriously the tenth iteration of Freddy Fazbear. He's precariously brought to life in Spooky Mansion Dreadbear, a la the Parts and Services minigame, and stalks the playtester throughout Danger Keep Out. I wonder what Boris Karloff would have looked like in VR. Grim Foxy. We were all obviously clamoring for a Jacko Foxy since back in FNAF 4's DLC, and our prayers were finally answered. Grim Foxy is the primary antagonist of the Afraid of the Dark portion of Help Wanted's DLC. He stalks the spooky, confusing corn maze and hosts the theme park-esque on-rail shooter pirate ride. Freddy Frostbear. Yet another Freddy Fazbear, this cool customer only comes around just once a year. Spreading holiday fear to homes across the world, Freddy Frostbear makes every Christmas just a little spookier. He has the unique ability to completely freeze the player during augmented reality gameplay. Like I mentioned at the start of the video, the FNAF phenomenon has been around for almost a decade. With such humble beginnings, it's hard to quantify how much has changed over the years. Fret not though, we've got you covered on that end. Although it is still ever-changing, we've got a video about the series as it evolved. Get ready for Five Nights at Freddy's throughout the years. Hello? Hello, hello? Oh, sorry. I was just leaving a voicemail for a, uh, co-worker. So grab your popcorn, folks, and top it with your favorite exotic butters. Today, we're going over the evolution of the Five Nights at Freddy's games. Starting with FNAF 1. Since the very beginning, Five Nights at Freddy's has been developed by the auteur known as Scott Cawthon, and the first game released on July 24th, 2014. Wait, Dan, FNAF is five years old already? Man, it's like the uh, target audience is almost in high school by now. Now, unlike the lore, the premise is simple. You play as a night guardsman at Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria, a magical place for kids and grown-ups alike where fantasy and fun come to life. Yes, fantasy and fun, also known as horrifying animatronics creeping around at night, trying to stuff the player into an unoccupied, empty animatronic suit, thus mangling their bodies. The objective of the game is to survive the night. Until the clock reaches the sweet, sweet sunrise of 6 a.m., you have to fend off said animatronics from entering the office and killing you. The game introduces five animatronics. Freddy Fazbear, Chica, Bonnie, Foxy, and Golden Freddy, each with their own unique ways to sneak into the security office. Foxy's is, without a doubt, the scariest. The tools used for survival are limited, to say the least. See, you cycle through a variety of cameras to keep an eye on the animatronics, and spotting them throughout the pizzeria can help keep some at bay. Back in the office, you have control over two hall lights and two doors on each side of the office. When an animatronic is right outside, you can use the light to see them and shut the doors in their face. Sounds pretty easy, right? Unfortunately, Freddy seems to have a, a bit of a budget issue, as the cameras, lights, and doors all drain your very limited power supply. If an animatronic slips past your security or you run out of power, it's game over. And unlike most games, there's an actual real-world consequence for losing. A truly horrifying jump scare. Every moment of gameplay is extremely tense, and the reason why I'm constantly buying new pants. The game is a masterclass in simplicity, which really works to its horrific favor. In general, the backgrounds and environments are static, so the little motion that you do encounter is all the more shocking and jarring. But the atmosphere and jump scares only grew from there. FNAF 2! So, the first FNAF was insanely successful, and the follow-up, Five Nights at Freddy's 2, was released shortly after on November 10th, 2014. The premise is similar, you know, night guard in a Freddy Fazbear location must survive the nights as they're being attacked by a variety of animatronics. Classic ghouls of the first game are back, though in withered forms. They've certainly seen better days, even though this game takes place before FNAF 1, so they weren't scrapped yet, but... Okay, look, the timeline's already really confusing, and I already covered it, okay? This game shows off how large these monstrosities are when they creep into the office, but this time, they're not alone. They're joined by their toy counterparts, Beakless Toy Chica, Toy Bonnie, Toy Freddy, and Mangle, acting as Toy Foxy. These smiling, shiny bastards are deceptively adorable, and were actually created as monitoring security systems. We also get to meet everyone's favorite character, <laughs> Boy. I mean, Balloon Boy. Oh, BB, how I hate you so much. And the fun doesn't stop there. We also have the most terrifying animatronic yet, the phantom-like puppet. So now we're dealing with double the monsters, but that wasn't enough variety for Mr. Coffin. With FNAF 2, he says, hey, how about I take away the doors? You know, the, the main way to defend yourself. That's right. FNAF 2's security office is anything but secure. Basically, you know, you're positioned at the end of a long hallway, sandwiched right between two empty vents. <sighs> Joy. You can still keep some animatronics at bay by keeping an eye on them through the many cameras, and this time, you're equipped with two new tools. First, you can use a flashlight to freeze the monsters in their tracks, but its power is again limited. 
I guess the budget has been further slashed. You can also wear a Freddy mask to disguise yourself. Some of these here animatronics aren't too bright, so they'll think you're part of the exclusive club. It would be great to just hide under this mask the whole time, but unfortunately, the puppet is extremely needy. The player needs to constantly keep this gangly f satisfied by manually winding his or her music box, or else they'll beeline right to your location. FNAF 2 also introduced the iconic 8-bit minigames that really expanded the lore. FNAF 2 is really quite the sequel and introduces all of these new threats and mechanics, but still keeps the game balanced. It's certainly a step up in difficulty, so how many animatronics would Scott add for the third title? Let's find out in FNAF 3. Well, Scott must have been a fan of the Alien franchise, you know, like me, because when Five Nights at Freddy's 3 dropped on March 2nd, 2015, it only had one animatronic. At least it's the most terrifying one. Good ol' Willie Afton, aka Springtrap, aka Spring Bonnie, is lurking through Fazbear's Fright Fest, and it's up to you to protect yourself from becoming his first adult victim. But this doesn't make the game any easier. Once again, you need to keep track of Springtrap using the now 15 closed circuit cameras. But this time, your office is well lit. So you have to lure Springtrap away from the office using little audio cues of laughing children. Springtrap just can't resist that sweet, sweet temptation of innocence. So damn disturbing. Additionally, you have the power to block off certain sections of the ventilation system, halting old Springy in his tracks. FNAF 3 is set in 2023, so the power doesn't gradually deplete anymore. Instead, audio, camera, and ventilation systems periodically shut down and you must reboot them manually. It takes precious time and gives Afton the perfect opportunity to sneak into the office, so you have to be very careful. At least his jump scare isn't too terrifying, he kind of just like takes a slow step towards the camera. But don't worry, there's still plenty to worry about. Phantom versions of the animatronics from the previous games show up to jump scare you out of nowhere. It doesn't kill you, but it does cause your character to panic and shuts down a system. So now the jump scares are no longer a punishment, they just happen, and, and you're tested to keep your cool somehow. Scott kept the dynamic gameplay of the first two titles with only one truly horrifying threat. It was initially supposed to be the end of the series, wrapping things up in a nice neat trilogy bow, but then he decided to create the uh, final chapter. FNAF 4, the final chapter, pulled a Friday the 13th, prematurely claiming to wrap up the series, again, when it came out on July 23rd, 2015. And Scott truly wanted to go out with a <laughs> That's the only one, guys. I promise. Getting away from a security office, FNAF 4 takes place in a little room in a cozy house. Kinda like the one you're sitting in right now. And instead of being a coveted professional security guard earning fat stacks, you're stuck in the body of a small child. Just like you are now just to, you know, add to your vulnerability. So I guess the animatronics weren't terrifying enough for Scott, because our friends Bonnie, Chica, Foxy, and Freddy are back, though this time in horrifying nightmare form, complete with razor sharp teeth and soul piercing evil eyes. The final challenge is a shadowy Freddy known simply as Nightmare. Oh, and there's also adorable mini Freddies chilling on your bed. A later Halloween update also added Nightmare Mangle, the Nightmare Yonette, and Nightmare Boy. Though we still never really got the answer we were really looking for with said update. What's in the box? Gameplay-wise, it was time to finally ditch the cameras. A bold move considering that the camera monitoring was the focal point of the previous titles. Eh. Instead, you need to run between your bed, two doors, and a closet, with a flashlight as your only tool. You need to know when to open a door, or keep it closed, when to shine or turn off your flashlight, and when to dash across the room. Without cameras, sharp audio perception is key in FNAF 4. You need to be able to hear when a nightmare is lurking right outside your room. So if you, like me, turn the sound down to soften the jump scare effect, Scott's 300 IQ has you bested. There's also the plush trap mini game where you have to perfectly time shining a light on a miniature spring trap who only moves when you're not looking. These games really want to scar those of us who still enjoy playing with toys. FNAF World. So, FNAF World came out on January 21st, 2016. It's the combination of classic JRPG, FNAF, and terrible design and gameplay everyone was asking for. Moving on to Sister Location. On October 7th, 2016, Sister Location was released, continuing the spooks and scares of FNAF despite the closure that Scott clearly gave us in previous entries. We have a gambit of new circus-themed animatronics this time around, led by the sweet voice of Circus Baby. Other main featured animatronics include Ballora, Funtime Foxy, and Funtime Fredbear, with some assistance from some pint-sized horrors like Bitty Bab. 
truly a fun time, let me tell ya. It gets even better when the animatronics combine forces to create Ennard. So, previous FNAF entries have the same basic gameplay for each level slash night that progressively ramped in difficulty as the nights went on. Night 1 is pretty tame, Night 5 is super hard, Night 6 is nearly impossible. The steep difficulty curve is in sister location, but this time around there's a heavy amount of variety from night to night. One night you'll be hiding from Biddy Bab under a desk, another night you'll be fending off mini arenas inside a spring lock suit, another night you'll be slowly traversing through the darkness, equipped with only a flashlight as you're stalked by Funtime Foxy. It's extremely impressive and bold that Scott decided to experiment with so many new variations on the FNAF formula. But don't you worry. After finding a secret room on Night 5, Sister Location gives you the classic FNAF 1 frantic camera switching experience as Ennard hunts you down. I'll garnish like poetry so that, you know, they rhyme. It all comes full circus, uh, circle. The presentation became more polished as the series went on, and Sister Location ends each night with a fun cutscene. You know, after a stressful night at work, your character munches popcorn while getting caught up on the immortal and the restless. After Sister Location, it's time for a break from horrifying pizzeria locations. So Scott made one that's a little more friendly. Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria Simulator. Pizzeria Simulator is just that. A simulator. Well, at first. Released on December 4th, 2017, the sixth real FNAF game starts out innocently enough. You design your own pizzeria complete with a stage, off-brand animatronics, and games for the kiddies to enjoy. You have to manage your budget, overall restaurant appeal, and of course, liability. Because the only thing more terrifying than killer animatronics is a lawsuit. Unfortunately, you're forced to burn the candle at both ends as you work the night away, ordering supplies, printing advertising, unclogging toilets, and completing other busy work before you can leave home for the night. That wouldn't be too much of a problem if it wasn't for mysteriously arriving animatronics. They show up outside every night and they need to be salvaged one by one. This time around, we have Molten Freddy, Scrap Baby, Scrap Trap, and Lefty. Instead of beating out the clock and making it to morning, you simply need to accomplish your tasks before clocking out. Of course, the technology is outdated, so it makes for some tense waiting. You have to manage the noise level and temperature of your security office so that you don't attract the salvaged monstrosities. Darn noisy fan. And all you have are a flashlight for the vents, a motion detector, and some distracting audio cues. Good luck! Pizzeria Simulator shows just how difficult being a franchise owner can be in the cutthroat, jump-scare world of business. Outside of the main game, there's a variety of different gameplay and game modes showcased. For example, you can test the different salvaged animatronics through audio cues while keeping them at arm's length with controlled shocks. And the purchased arcade games like Fruity Maze create a wealth of fun and no disturbing imagery at all, I, I promise you. Overall, there's all sorts of things to do and ways to play Pizzeria Simulator. Not quite as many as the next title. Ultimate Custom Night. They're all here. Released on June 27th, 2018, Ultimate Custom Night is the perfect culmination of the past six titles. 50, that's right, 50, though actually it's 61, animatronics from the series are back in the Ultimate Best of compilation. Their difficulty can be adjusted from one to 20, and instead of surviving five or six nights, the objective is to simply survive the one night and achieve a high score. This time, the torture intensity is in your hands. Every animatronic is back, from the withered, to the toy, to the nightmare varieties. Additionally, previously harmless animatronics found in Pizzeria Simulator are back and actually able to kill you. This includes the Rockstar animatronics, Orville, Pig Patch, everyone's favorite yarn weaver Mr. Hippo, everyone. Even Candy Cadet shows up in the background. All day, every day, candy, candy, candy. The gameplay is also an ultimate amalgamation of all previous titles. Once again, energy management is the name of the game, and you'll need to constantly be checking doors and lights, watching the cameras, managing vents, winding up that old music box, keeping the noise level low, wearing the Freddy mask as a disguise. It's really, really overwhelming. Well, you know, if you customize it that way at least. To help make things slightly easier, you can spend fast coins at the prize corner to mitigate the effects of certain animatronics. Even better, a single death coin completely eliminates a hostile animatronic. Only 49 to go! So, how could things get any more intense than an ultimate custom night? FNAF VR. Help wanted. I'm sorry I asked. FNAF VR Help Wanted, released on May 28th, 2019, is one of the most genius uses of VR yet. And by genius, I mean like, mad scientist genius. It's basically what the title suggests, a VR version of FNAF, with nearly full remakes of the first three titles. Only this time, there's no looking away from the screen. No couch cushions to hide behind. There's no escape. As if that weren't enough, 
bang for your buck, Help Wanted also has a bounty of side and minigames, like the Darkroom games. They're a lot like FNAF 4's Plush Trap minigame and the Funtime Foxy's Night in Sister Location. You have to use flashlights, light flashes, and audio cues to survive. In Parts and Services, you must repair salvaged animatronics a la Pizzeria Simulator. Vent Repair pits you against Mangle and Ennard in a tense, claustrophobic maintenance nightmare. And in Night Terrors, you have to carefully focus on audio to protect yourself against creatures lurking on the other side of a door, just like FNAF 4. We even get a couple of new monsters in Help Wanted with Plush Baby and the Nefarious Glitch Trap. And yes, the biggest evolution is indeed the virtual reality. Not everyone is an early adopter, but if you can experience this horror in VR, just trust me. It's as heart-stopping as you think. And to cap everything off, here are five mind-blowing facts about Five Nights at Freddy's. Try to keep your top hat on. Freddy Fazbear and his cast of animatronic pals have been on the forefront of internet culture since we first met them in 2014. And through all the horrifying jump scares, harrowing adventures, and terrifying spreadsheets to keep track of the lore, some facts were bound to slip under your radar. Hi, I'm Jacob with The Leaderboard, and I'm here to fill you in on some little-known info about everyone's favorite animatronic bear and pizza franchise. This is five Five Nights at Freddy's facts that'll blow your mind. And before we get started, don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell icon to become part of our notification squad. So what's next for FNAF? As of right now, the future of the franchise is up in the air. Creator Scott Cawthon has confirmed that the main story has been wrapped up since the release of Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria Simulator and that he'll no longer be a one-man team. He wanted to finish this chapter of the series himself and has turned down opportunities with more prominent publishers to complete it alone. Following the release of Pizzeria Simulator, Cawthon is going to revisit some of his previous projects, which means that there is a chance that we can get some more Five Nights at Freddy's games in the future, or possibly a new Chipper and Sons lumber company. At the time of recording this video, there's been no more news on this front, but given the success of this franchise, it seems more than likely that a publisher will pick up the IP. Cawthon insists that if there's ever going to be another Five Nights game, he'd want an experienced publisher to work on it to make the game something incredible. As far as the story goes, it's possible that the next game could look to the future, in the same vein as the first novel, Five Nights at Freddy's The Silver Eyes, which takes place ten years after Freddy Fazbear's Pizza has been shut down. Unfortunately, we could still be years away from a new FNAF game, but Cawthon didn't want to leave us hanging. A couple days after he made his official announcement that he would no longer be working on future games, Cawthon revealed that based on community feedback, Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria Simulator would be receiving a custom night update, which Cawthon is calling the ultimate custom night, so get hype! The custom nights have been a staple of Five Nights at Freddy's games since the very first game was released in 2014. The game mode grants players complete freedom over gameplay and gives them the options to set custom difficulty levels and add or remove animatronics from the map. And if you're anything like us here at the leaderboard, it means that you crank every setting up to maximum difficulty and then you add in every possible animatronic while trying to survive the entire night and failing horror over and over again. The custom night mode offers significant replayability, and that's not all. In addition to the endless possibilities, custom night also offers extra little bits of lore for the franchise's overarching story. In the case of Pizzeria Simulator, though, since pretty much all of the major loose ends were tied up and resolved over the course of the game, Cawthon has said that Pizzeria Simulator's custom night will offer new developer diary content instead of story details. Custom night for Pizzeria Simulator is set to feature every animatronic in the series, which is both incredibly exciting and terrifying, as if I needed another game for the puppet to terrorize me in. Right now, Cawthon is about three quarters of the way done with the update, and you can check his progress over at scottgames.com. But remember, a watch pod never boils, and in the case of Scott Cawthon, there's a solid chance that if you stare at that progress bar long enough, an animatronic mascot might jump out of your screen and scare you. I have no idea if this will actually happen, but don't stare at the progress bar, and if an animatronic does scare you, I told you so. Cawthon has said that each character is worth about 2% of the bar, so you can go ahead and use your own math skills to figure out how many more he has to add at this point. But if math isn't your thing, allow me to help you out. Right now, Cawthon's goal is to have the Custom Night update finished for the four-year anniversary of the first Five Nights at Freddy's game, which would make August 8th the tentative release date. Oh, and of course, it'll be free. This is some exciting news, unless you are among the fans hoping for an endless Pizzeria Tycoon game, but don't worry, Cawthon hasn't ruled it out yet. If games aren't your thing, though, it, what are you doing here? How did you get to this part of the internet? But if that's somehow true, and you still want to know what all the FNAF hype is about, then maybe you want to check out the FNAF book trilogy. Plot details for the third book in the series, Five Nights at Freddy's The Fourth Closet, were just revealed on Amazon last month. According to the Amazon page, the fourth closet focuses more on the present day rather than the past like the first two books did. Most importantly, for fans of the series, the third book will answer how Charlie was able to survive the events of the Twisted Ones. The fourth closet will once again be co-written by Cawthon and Kira Breed Risley and is set to be released on June 26, 2018. But outside of books, Five Nights at Freddy's is also apparently getting a movie adaptation. The first talk of a film started way back in April of 2015 when Warner Brothers Pictures acquired the rights to adapt Five Nights at Freddy's into a movie. 
movie. Seth Graham Smith was listed as a producer for the movie and wanted to make an insane, terrifying, and weirdly adorable movie. Shortly after, in July of 2015, Gil Keenan was announced as the director and co-writer of the FNAF movie, along with Tyler Burton Smith as the other co-writer. Throughout 2015, Keenan posted several pictures online of animatronic mock-ups that we can only assume were for the Five Nights at Freddy's movie. However, nothing is a guarantee in Hollywood, and in January of 2017, Cawthon stated that partially due to problems within the movie industry as a whole, any progress on the movie had effectively been scrapped, and the project was back to square one without a director, or writer, or Warner Brothers. Determined to see the project through, Cawthon promised to be involved with the movie from day one. In March of 2017, Cawthon announced that Blumhouse Productions obtained the rights and would be adapting the movie. Blumhouse is most famous for their low-budget but massively profitable horror films, such as Get Out, Insidious, The Purge, Split, and Paranormal Activity, just to name a few. And after that great news, the news just kept getting better. In February of 2018, legendary movie maker Chris Columbus signed on to write, direct, and produce the movie adaptation of Five Nights at Freddy's. Early on in his career, Columbus was a screenwriter, and he worked on some classic 80s movies like Gremlins, The Goonies, and Young Sherlock Holmes. As a director, Columbus has worked on Home Alone, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, and Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, among other films. Last but not least, Columbus was a producer on Night of the Museum, which might not exactly be a horror movie, but it is a movie about wax figures and museum paraphernalia coming to life, so that experience will probably translate pretty well to Five Nights at Freddy's. There's no words on a release date or anything yet, but things are definitely trending upwards for the movie. As I mentioned earlier, the release of Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria Simulator unpacked a lot of the series' major lore questions, so let's go over a few. First, we have some pretty solid evidence that the cassette man in Pizzeria Simulator is Henry, William Afton's business partner. Henry first appeared in the Five Nights at Freddy's novel, The Silver Eyes. According to Scott Cawthon, The Silver Eyes is a canonical story in the Five Nights universe, but is set in an alternate reality because it was difficult to tell the story of the games within the same timeline. Hmm, I wonder whose fault that is, Scott? I'm joking. But seriously, the story is really complicated. In the novel, it's revealed that Henry is the co-owner of Freddy Fazbear's Pizza and the one who first invented the iconic animatronics in Freddy Fazbear, Bonnie the Bunny, and Chica the Chicken. However, unlike William, Henry was a good and innocent man. He never wanted to hurt people. The novel reveals that he was tricked by William into creating animatronics that would kill children, and eventually the guilt from it caused him to close down the restaurant and commit suicide. The evidence that Henry is the cassette man can be seen during the insanity ending for Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria Simulator. There's a hidden audio file labeled HRY223, where the cassette man can be heard confirming that he accidentally helped William Afton by creating the animatronics and he wants to right William's wrongdoings. Based on the audio file, it sounds like Henry wants to atone and destroy all of the remaining animatronics haunted by the spirits, which is why they're gathered all throughout the game. In the true ending of Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria Simulator, we also learn the identity of Circus Baby. After a creepy bit of dialogue from Circus Baby, Henry slash Cassette Man says, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Elizabeth, if you even still remember that name, but I'm afraid you've been misinformed. The line all but confirms that the soul of Elizabeth Afton is in the body of Circus Baby, and also, as a general note, just let us know that Ice Cream Girl's name was Elizabeth, which really makes doing these videos so much easier, because now YouTubers can just say Elizabeth instead of Ice Cream Girl. Oh, who am I kidding? No one's gonna to do that. Lastly, we learn that Henry's daughter was one of the first victims that William killed. After playing the security puppet game a third time, we learn that a child wearing a green bracelet was left out in the rain. Once the puppet is finally able to get outside, the daughter is dead and the puppet short circuits. In the true ending of FNAF 6, Henry says, My daughter, if you can hear me, I knew that you would return as well. It's in your nature, to protect, your nature to protect I'm sorry the innocent. I'm sorry that on that day, the day you were shut out and left to die, no one was there to lift you up into their arms, the way you lifted others into yours. In the insanity ending, Henry also alludes to the fact that his daughter was murdered by William in the HRY223 audio file. With the game ending in the pizzeria going up in flames, it's pretty safe to assume that all of the events that happened in Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria Simulator were an elaborate plan by Henry to put an end to the Afton family and the entire story of the franchise. There are still some mysteries that are left unanswered, of course, but hey, that's what sequels are for. And what would FNAF be without sequels? We did it. We made it through all those facts and all five nights multiple times. Hopefully you kept your heart rate in a healthy range. What did you think of this Five Nights at Freddy's Marathon? Did it help you get hyped up for the movie this spooky season? Which game is your favorite? Make sure you let me know down in the comments and subscribe to the leaderboard for more like this. Thanks for watching.